Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the market outlook in South Africa for solar PV and battery energy storage as load shedding recedes. My name is Chris Yelland and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence and I'll be your host at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also sharing a link with you now on the Zoom chat facility where you can download the presenter biographies. So please take a look out on the um, uh, chat uh, and you will see the link to download the presenter bios. A big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation today. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence, uh, but I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, Vantage Green X, the Climate Policy Initiative, Geltex, Go Solar, the Energy Group, and GeoTerra Image for their most valued support and participation in this webinar and for the great work they do in this field for the industry. About 2,000 delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This makes the webinar one of the biggest that we have ever hosted at EE Business Intelligence. I believe that this attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered and also to the stature of the presenters. So may I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort they've put in. Please do note that this, we uh, this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly and shared to all those that registered to attend, as well as publicly. Colleagues, this webinar will consider the future market prospects for solar PV and battery energy storage in South Africa, as well as the view ahead for the residential, commercial, agricultural, manufacturing, industrial, mining, and public procurement sectors, where the underlying policy and economic and decarbonization drivers will likely continue even as the security of supply driver fades as uh, load shedding has seemed to have come to an end. The program for the day has been widely circulated, but a link to download the program will be shared again here now on the Zoom chat facility. So again, please do look out for the link on the chat facility where you can download the program for today. But just to recap, first, we're gonna have an opening address by Alistair Campbell, who is the Managing Director at Vantage Green X. Then four expert presenters will each give 20 minute presentations. And after this, uh, we'll have a wrap up with key takeaways by Jonathan First, who is the Senior Advisor and Africa Representative of the Climate Policy Initiative. Thereafter, we have set aside about 30 minutes for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions in an open discussion and Q&A session. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Zoom Q&A text facility. Uh, you may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. So without further ado, I will now introduce Alistair Campbell, who is the Managing Director at Vantage Green X, who is going to deliver the opening address. So as I said, uh, Alistair is MD at Vantage Green X's three sustainable energy debt funds, uh, which have a total of 8.3 billion rands of assets under management. Alistair is a chartered accountant and has a BCom degree from the University of Cape Town. He completed his articles at Deloitte in Johannesburg and then moved to London, where he worked for NatWest Markets for joining Standard Bank in London. After working for several years on projects in Africa, Eastern Europe and Latin America, Alistair transferred back to Johannesburg to head power finance at Standard Bank, where he oversaw the funding of more than 15 billion rands 
of debt to 15 solar PV and wind projects in the bid windows one and two of the REAP program. He then joined Vantage Green X in January 2014. So with that introduction, I'd like to now hand over uh, to you, Alistair, for your opening address. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, good morning to everybody, or good afternoon to everybody. Um, as I'm not a technical person, I'm not going to attempt to, to provide any technical insight, but what I would like to do in these opening remarks is just provide a macro picture from a, a banker's perspective of the the factors that are affecting the outlook for the battery and solar PV sectors. Uh, it's exciting times and there's a lot happening. I've limited my opening remarks to three points. Uh, the first is the impact of the cost of electricity. The second is CBAM and how it's going to affect us. And the third is national treasury guarantees and, and the possibility that we're going to lose them in the going in the in the near future. Looking at the first one, the cost of electricity, uh, the problem that we have in this country is that we've been paying for Madupi, Kasile and Angula since 2008. And what it's done is force the price of electricity up uh, so precipitously that, that we're now sitting in a situation where uh, putting in solar and battery is, is no longer a nice to have or a, a, to get green credentials. Uh, it's actually becoming uh, or has become an important uh, alternative to expensive power being supplied by either the municipality or, or ESCOM. But the second factor that's affecting the cost of electricity is the decrease in demand. And this slide um, shows it quite, uh, uh, shows it very well. The, the demand in 2018 has come right down to where we are in 2024. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, there's been uh, attrition in the in the load or demand due to businesses failing uh, as a result of either COVID or um, increasing prices of electricity. And secondly, because of people migrating away from from ESCOM and putting up their own solar solutions, that is is borne out in the next slide, which shows quite clearly how the impact of rooftop solar has has impacted us as consumers. Uh, the, the graphs for 2018 up at the top has come right down to 2024, which shows how much demand there is on a weekly basis. The, the, the decrease in demand can largely be attributed to, to the solar um, coming in, kicking in first thing in the morning and, and obviously seeing us through to the end of the day where people are using batteries um, at night. Um, <clears throat> All of these factors are, are not going to change too much in the future. And, and certainly we need to respond as a country uh, in terms of building new generation. And this is, is illustrated quite uh, clearly by this chart here, which shows when all of the ESCOM coal-fired power plants are going to be decommissioned. The challenge that, that we have is, is to try and work out which is the best alternative in terms of new generation. The Lazard LCO e analysis or levelized cost of energy analysis is quite clear. And, and as a simple accountant, looking at this chart here, the bottom three are the, are the ones that would make the most sense. We should be going for, for gas, wind, and solar. We should not be putting in new coal, uh, the dotted line over here, and we should not be putting in new nuclear. Um, this is in contrast to, to what is being said by politicians and, and some of the public servants. So, I quote, um, Zizamila Mbamo, who is the DMRA DDG, there is new acceptance that nuclear is part of the solution in terms of providing baseload electricity to make sure that we achieve the carbon emissions target. I'm not sure about that. And, and certainly if we if we do or acquire new electricity based on tariff, then the nuclear should not be in that mix. Uh, Lazard doesn't show what battery storage costs have done, and this is a relatively old slide, but certainly you can see the impact of, of battery storage, and, and it too should be in the energy mix. So where are we in terms of the energy mix? The, the emerging long-term plan, the IP2023, soon to be revised and updated, hopefully imminently. Um, it does include uh, a number of the, the things that I've mentioned. There's, there's obviously solar PV 
um, wind, um, battery storage, uh, and then also gas. Uh, whether we need nuclear is a, is a debatable question. Uh, the, the private rollout of, of um, PV, both to at a utility scale and, and as and at a resident residential level, um, is hopelessly understated in, in this iteration of the IFP, and certainly we expect the numbers to be much higher going forward. The second issue is CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. We have no control over this. It's something that Europe is, is implementing as our largest single body of, of, of or our, our biggest trade partner is Europe. That, that comprises roughly 35% of all of our exports. And, and they're about to start levying huge taxes on, on any um, uh, products that have been produced in countries that are, are carbon uh, emitters, large carbon emitters. And South Africa is right in the middle of that. Um, it's going to have a massive impact on us, and the penalties are going to affect the, the viability of businesses in South Africa going forward. You can see here that the three countries that, that are, are touted to, to have the, the most impact are South Africa, Brazil, Turkey. It's going to affect our iron and steel business, fertilizers, cement, aluminium, and chemicals. And if we don't reduce our emissions, uh, then we're certainly going to find ourselves um, paying huge penalties and will become increasingly more uncompetitive. The, this chart shows how, as a country, we can transition. We are potentially going to stay much closer to the top here because we are we still are going to produce power, most of our power from coal, um, but we need to get somewhere down here. And and the the challenge now is to try and in, increase the amount of clean power that we have in our energy mix, and to ensure that we we um, uh, get to the net zero uh, level. So on the third slide or the third point. National Treasury guarantees. The issue that that we have in this country right now is that is that lenders such as the fund that I manage are being asked to provide money to IPPs that are selling power to ESCOM. Um, ESCOM is technically insolvent, insolvent, and I'll show that in a moment. And so the challenge is is how do we carry on lending to IPPs if the off taker um, security that we have as as a lender falls away. And, and by that, I'm talking about the National Treasury Guarantee, which stands behind ESCOM's payment obligations. If that Treasury Guarantee falls away, then we are effectively providing money to, to IPPs who, who are selling to an insolvent off taker. The state guarantees, there's no, there's no um, secret that Treasury is looking at ways to get rid of those uh, uh, guarantees. Um, how does that affect us as a lender? The DSCR of, of um, ESCOM right now is 0.55. By that, I mean it's only covering its debt, 55% 55, 55 of its debt payment obligations. You, you cannot sustain that for in the long term. And, and as a result, if ESCOM were to, to go insolvent and the Treasury guarantee were to fall away, we would find ourselves in a situation with defaulting loans, uh, a buyer of the power that cannot actually pay. And, and the next, uh, and, and then the question is wh who is going to buy that power and, and how we're going to get paid as lenders to these IPPs. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's, there's a bit of a, a spat going on right now. You've got ESCOM trying to protect its distribution business and, and also to, to put obstacles in the way of, of the private sector coming to, to play in the space. Um, and, and the most recent uh, news piece was, was when uh, Discovery Green was, uh, there was an objection to Discovery Green getting a trading license and that will play out in future. From a government perspective, how is this all um, playing out? Uh, we, we have the energy action plan for guidance. And certainly it's interesting to, to see that for the first time in a number of years, uh, there's there's actually quite a lot of align, alignment between the private sector and <clears throat> excuse me and and the government policy. From a fixing ESCOM perspective, I think we can all agree with load shedding going away that that things are improving. The acceleration of private investment is is happening, and I'll show that to you in a moment. 
uh, green new generation capacity is is also coming online, but the fast tracking of it is an issue. And then the unleashing of businesses to up to to invest in rooftop solar and the transformation of the sector are, are all happening, but but there's a lot of room for improvement. <clears throat> uh, there's a grid constraint in this country right now. Uh, there is there's not a lot of capacity around the western Northern Cape and the Western Cape, and the, and our transmission lines don't have the capacity to to meet all of, or to to accept any new major projects in these areas. So the the rollout of infrastructure to improve that. Um, situation it is obviously going to have to be a priority of the government. The SAREG or SA Renewable Energy Grid Survey, which was done um, recently and announced um, in the press a couple of weeks ago, uh, provides an indication of just how much interest there is and how much growth there is in the in the solar space. There's 133,000 megawatts of capacity. That, that could potentially come online in the future. The ones in red are uh, have EIAs approved. Uh, the sorry, and the green ones, the, the peachy ones, I beg your pardon. And green is is future applications for EIAs. One hundred and thirty three thousand megawatts versus an install capacity of just over forty in, in South Africa. That's a huge amount of development That's taking done. place. Almost done, Chris. Um, from a technology perspective, the yellow you can see is is mainly PV, and um, and as a result, there's there's a huge amount of of, uh, of interest in this space, and and obviously in the hence why this this webinar is is of such interest. From a, a DMRE versus private perspective, yellow is DMRE and green is the private, um, and you can see from all of these that there's a huge amount of interest and a huge amount of development that is taking place in the market. What is significant is not, that not all of the players in the space contributed to this um, to this survey. Uh, if if they had, the interest levels would have, or the the megawatts would have been even higher. So with that, I'd, I'd like to hand back to Chris. Um, the, the space is is certainly uh, very busy, and certainly there's going to be a lot of development going forward. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alistair, for those opening remarks. Um, and I think you've outlined, uh, you know, three important drivers uh, and indicated that there is, in fact, a lot of opportunity out there, constrained uh, as it is uh, by grid access. Um, but uh, we're now going to move on to our next uh, two presenters, actually, uh, doing a joint presentation. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you now uh, the presenters from GeoTerra Image. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to their insights um, on the uh, market potential for solar PV going forward. Uh, so the first of the presenters from uh, GeoTerra Image is Elsie Zwenis. Elsie is a marketing and branding and communications manager at GeoTerra Image, uh, and they are a provider of geospatial data, products and services that enhance business intelligence. With over, 10, with over a decade of experience, LC is dedicated to transform, transforming complex data into actionable insights that support strategic decision-making. LC builds client relationships uh, that ensure clients fully grasp the capabilities and of up-to-date data uh, and relevant data in today's rapidly changing landscape. Her approach combines uh, strategy and creativity, focusing on tailored solutions, and by leveraging in innovative strategies, she connects businesses with their target audiences and empowers them to make informed decisions. And she is uh, then supported by uh, uh, Ross Solomons, uh, who is a, a technical specialist, a geospatial specialist at GeoTerra Image. Uh, and uh, he has more than 10 years experience in developing and applying advanced GIS analytical techniques. He's currently focused on GeoTerra Image's image solar analytics data set, uh, identifying trends within the data analyzing and visualizing spatial data, and introducing these to clients to provide insights into solar installations across South Africa. Ross has strategic perspective in bridging the gap between uh, client requirements and the solutions that address these to ensure informed decision-making. And in this webinar, Ross will share key findings and offer a detailed look 
at demand forecasting in the South African solar energy sector. So a very important uh, player and uh, uh, presentation today uh, uh, that is very data focused, information and data and uh, science based. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation. So I think over to you, Elsie, in the first instance. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction and the opportunity to join in today's uh, webinar discussion. As Chris mentioned, I'm from Geoterra Image and I'm also joined by one of my colleagues, Ross. So just to touch on just to touch on an overview of what we will be presenting today, we've noticed some drastic changes in the solar and PV markets across South Africa, as I'm sure many of you have. So for the purpose of this presentation, we would like to share some trends and insights we've been noticing when looking at our solar analytic analytics data set, as well as looking at our data collectively. Also, Ross will explore um, one or two examples on these, as well as pose some interesting questions to the market um, in terms of market opportunities and new insights, um, which might not have been explored previously by the industry. So then just to give you a brief indicate overview on the company. Geotero Image is a commercial company. We've been in business for over 25 years. Our expertise in geospatial data and analytic analytics provide us with a unique market um, position. We have also been supporting a wide variety of public and private entities across multiple industries through innovative product solutions and insights to specifically understand your market and new market opportunities. So then to roll over into more detail on our sonar analytics data sets and um, some insights. Ross is going to take you through that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yes, so um, as Elsie says, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the, the solar insights that we've been developing over the last little while. Um, so we have been mapping out solar panels uh, at a national level across the country. And the reason for this is that through conversation with uh, SAPVIA, we found that there is a need for reliable statistics on the current use of solar power uh, in South Africa, and not just estimates, but true on the ground installations. So what is actually being installed currently? So we have captured this at a national level, but just importantly, we also maintain information about land use of buildings across the country as well. So the strength of this is that we can combine this with our solar analytics. So we don't only know where the solar panels are installed. We also know a little bit about the land use that they um, affect and therefore what the penetration might be per sector, such as residential, commercial, industrial, or whatever. So just some of the findings that we've found, I'm going to discuss some of these with you. One of the main things that we've noticed, which was to be expected, is that uh, the vast majority of installations um, have occurred in higher income communities. So we compare our, our solar panel data set to a neighborhood lifestyle index, which is an income-based segmentation of communities. And that's based on an index of one to 10. So uh, lower numbers indicating less affluent communities and higher numbers indicating your more affu affluent um, communities with, with a greater household income. And we found overwhelmingly that the vast majority of residential installations have occurred in the upper middle to higher income communities across the country. Um, we do see some in the middle income communities around NLI 5 and 6, but there's a big drop off as we move into the lower income communities in the lower NLI segment. What we do actually find is an uptick in installations of solar geysers. This is not something that we are necessarily keeping track of in our data set, but it is something that we have noticed that solar geese installations uh, seem to be quite predominant in the lower income areas. So we can look at this. The, the, the strength of looking at this geographically is that we can actually see the, the uneven socioeconomic distribution of solar panels. Um, so, for example, in some of our main metros, such as Tuane, we see quite a lot of solar panel installation in our more uh, affluent areas or our higher income neighborhoods. But there are some glaring gaps in our typically lower income areas, um, such as Mamalodi in the, the northeastern part of this uh, geographical area. 
We see a similar thing in Johannesburg as well, where our more affluent communities such as Bryanston, Sandton and Fourways see quite a lot of installation. But in areas such as Alexandra, we see um, you know, a big gap where installations are far less and also parts of Soweto as well. And again, we see this pattern carries over in the Cape as well. Same pattern emerges. So th this is quite important from a number of perspectives. Firstly, when looking for new markets to explore in terms of solar installations, uh, this data is obviously allows us to understand which communities are most likely to install in the future. But there's also a humanitarian aspect to this as well, where many organizations and NGOs, they want to know which communities are quite vulnerable at the time of a power outage or that kind of thing. So this data has importance in a lot of different realms of society. Just some of the insights that we have picked up, I just want to talk about some of the trends. Importantly, this is not based on the latest data. Uh, this is some of the trends that we've picked up along the way. We are currently in the process of putting together an update of this type of information. Um, but again, overwhelmingly, installations occurring in our upper income segmentations and a very big drop off as we enter lower income segmentations across the country which is quite important. Uh, we found that Tswane has been sort of at the forefront of installations, of solar panel installations. Um, and definitely the highest percentage of installations have occurred in Tswane, at least in the residential uh, sector. But the important thing about combining this data with land use information is that we actually see interesting patterns arising. So although Tswane might be ahead in terms of residential and maybe a few other aspects, we see that Etiquini, for example, is ahead in terms of commercial installations and industrial installations as well. So we're able to see these patterns based on the data that we, we put together. Um, but then back to Twane again in the educational sectors and healthcare, we see again that Twane is uh, overall got uh, you know greater amounts of installations percentage-wise. And with all land uses considered, again, Tswane ahead of the, the pack in that regard. And then just in terms of growth, so we did do some analysis on growth in, in some of the metros in South Africa. And we found that, interestingly, the greatest amount of growth occurs in our NLI 7 and 8 segment. Um, and interestingly, the, 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 the upper end of the income segmentation, 9 and 10, seem to show the least amount of growth in that bracket. Uh, and then you can sort of start to make assumptions around this. Uh, perhaps very early on, um, our highest income segmentations were the early adopters and, you know, NLR 7 and 8, the slightly uh, lower segment is now catching up. So we saw overall at a stage about 37% uh, increase in solar installations in the residential sphere in Cape Town and 41% in Tuane between 2022 and 23. And then just looking at some market insights, so to give you an example of the, the downstream use of this type of data, the strength of actually mapping out data geographically, is that if we take a neighborhood like this, we can straight away see which buildings have got solar installed on their rooftops. There's a few aspects that we can look at these neighborhoods in, in, in this regard. So firstly, we can look at how much coverage has occurred, actual physical rooftop coverage occurs per building and within an entire uh, sector, such as commercial and industrial. For example, in this neighborhood, we see about 87,000 square meters of available roof space in the commercial sector uh, with 24,000 square meters of solar panel of that uh, installed in terms of solar panels. And so we have a 27.6% uh, total rooftop coverage in this particular area in the commercial sector. But maybe, yeah, so if you look at this particular neighborhood, you can see that some of these buildings have a lot of install, you know, they, they, they have a, a quite a, a big proportion of installation. Some are partially installed. And then there's also glaring gaps where some of these uh, buildings don't have any installations. So maybe more importantly, we can actually see per sector uh, how many buildings do not have solar panels installed or low amounts of solar panels installed. And this obviously um, sparks questions for us. 
We have, for example, this building, this is a retail building in the, the northeastern segment of this particular uh, area. And you might ask the question, why is there no solar installed in that building? Is it potentially a future, um, is there potential for installation to occur on that building in the future, uh, dependent on what needs may arise for them? And then just in the residential sphere again, so when we detect these panels, we're also able to get an estimate of the size of the panels that are installed per property. So from this, we can get a general idea of how much power might be produced per property. We don't know what is happening underneath the roofs, obviously. We don't know what size inverters they've got and battery systems and so on. So it's difficult to know you know, that kind of information, but we can get a, a, a pretty good estimation of the peak kilowatts that are produced per stand. So in order to do that, obviously we know that different solar panels have got different qualities, different technologies. Um, you know, obviously efficiency is an important thing, but working with industry uh, experts and software, um, we have developed calculations that bring us to very good estimates of just how, um, you know, much energy may be produced per stand. And this is, again, is on an index basis as well. So lower numbers, um, one being your lowest shows the lowest amount of output and then 10, the highest amount of output. So that index is quite important. And then just before I move on to the next few slides, just briefly, I want to unpack the NLI because it's quite important with uh, in regard to the next few slides. So again, and the neighborhood lifestyle index, it is a, an household income based segmentation. So we have this index from one to 10, again, values of one indicating your poorer communities or lowest income areas and 10 indicating your higher income areas. And we then go and classify neighborhoods nationwide. So the entire country at a national level is mapped in this way. And looking at this map as a very simple example, we can actually see the income levels, general income levels of these particular areas. So this is just important for the next example where I've taken one of these neighborhoods and built a partially hypothetical uh, scenario of looking at demand forecasting in this particular neighborhood. So this neighborhood is a fairly high or very high on the NLI scale. So it is NLI 9, so a highly affluent area. But most importantly is that these uh, neighborhoods are not necessarily homogenous. So they won't, not all the properties in that particular area would be NLI9. Some of them might be middle income and some even lower income. But overall, on a weighted mean, this is a, an NLI9 high income neighborhood. So if we take a very simple scenario and we look at the number of houses in this neighborhood, we'll say there's 126 houses in this particular area, and 37 of these houses already have solar installed. That's a 29% um, penetration of solar installations in this residential area. So naturally we would assume that if we've got 126 houses and we subtract those that already have installations, there's a market of 89 houses left that might in the future install solar if there was the motivation for that um, in times of obviously difficulty with electricity. But this might not paint the true picture because if we look at the trends that we've picked up, as I mentioned in the last few slides, not all households would be in a position to install solar. So in this particular neighborhood, only 81 households fall within that Goldilocks zone, that income zone of NLI 7 to 10, the group that is most likely to install solar. So we should actually use that um, as a baseline. So we take the 81 houses that are most likely to install, and we subtract the 37 that already have installations, and we're actually left with 44 houses with the potential to install solar should the need arise in the future. And then this is quite a simplistic example, and there's a few other things we've got to take into account as well. But generally speaking, based on these calculations, you would have roughly a 54% market opportunity within that particular uh, range of households in this particular area. But there's a few other things that are very important to take into account here, and things such as disposable income, for example. So we would then compare this information with um, credit bureau or anonymized credit bureau information. Um, 
for this particular neighborhood, uh, such as disposable income. And we know then from that data what the average disposable income is in these neighborhoods. So how much money is left for spending after households have uh, already spent money on their monthly uh, bonds or vehicles or insurance. And we get a, a picture of how much disposable income remains um, you know, to be spent on solar, potentially to be spent on solar um, installations. And this is quite an important thing to take into account and, and should be considered. And we also find that in this neighborhood, um, the average property value or building value rather for the 37 houses that have got solar is calculated at about on an average of, of 2 million rand for that building. All right, so just to put a hypothetical example together. So as mentioned in the previous slides, there's a 54% market opportunity still in that NLI zone um, in this particular neighborhood. So if we take the 37 houses that already have installations and we look at the what our solar insight data tells us that this neighborhood already produces about 169 um, kilowatt peak overall in that area. We divide that by the, the number of buildings with so or properties with solar, we come to an average of 4.5 kilowatt peak per household in this neighborhood. So some of the households might have smaller systems, uh, three um, kilowatt systems, some might have five, eight kilowatt systems, and perhaps even larger than that, but the average would be 4.5. All right, so, so based on that, because we know that there are still, as mentioned in the previous slide, 44 houses that potentially may in, uh, install solar in the future, we times that by that average of 4.5, there's a potential for around 198 kilowatt peak of installation that could still occur here. And again, I must stress that the value that I'm mentioning here, this 100,000 Rand value per installation per property is highly hypothetical. Obviously, we are not installers. We don't dictate prices. So this is just used as an example. But if you were looking at these properties at an average of about 100,000 Rand uh, value per installation in this particular neighborhood, uh, you know, there could be around 4 million this whole area might represent a 4.4 million rand um, value in terms of future installations as a market. And then just something that I want to leave you with, uh, another interesting thing that we have detected is that we also calculate building a, something called a building value index. So we um, calculate what the costs of a, or the, sorry, not cost, of the value of buildings are in particular areas, Okay. And what we have noticed with that is that in typically lower income areas, we're seeing an uptick in um, the construction of very big households. So very large houses, so the values are over a million, two million, um, and even more than that, three million rand houses popping up in these areas that are considered to be low income areas. So what this tells us is, is that at the moment, there is definitely a flow of wealth from your typically urban areas to your um, lower, your, your, your typically lower income areas. And obviously, there's implications to that in terms of, of, of looking at the market for future solar installations. And, and these would obviously be, you know, a lot of the time, cash economies. And moving over to more rural settings, we have a similar thing where we see the up you know, these big houses springing up in these areas of um, 2 million rand and more even in a lot of cases. And these are in areas where services currently, there are no municipal services. So there's definitely a need for um, solar systems in these areas at some level. And so we just posed that question is that could these be uh, markets that could be tapped into in the future as potential? And yeah, that's that's it from, from us in terms of present, our presentation. Thank you, Chris. And again, thank you, um, both Elsie and Ross, for that fascinating uh, talk, uh, which I think is raising a lot of interest and questions in the audience. And I, I just want to answer one while, while I've got the mic. And, and people I can see on the chat and on the Q&A have asked, how can they access this information? Well, I just want to say, that GeoTerra Image is a commercial business. And in our feedback report that you will all get shortly after this webinar, 
I will include the contact details of the presenters and the presenter companies uh, so that you can make contact with them uh, and follow up with access to this data, uh, which obviously is provided on a, on a commercial basis, um, uh, which I'm going to leave to the companies themselves. Uh, that's not the role of this webinar. So thank you indeed to Ross and Elsie. Uh, and I'm now going to ask you to uh, switch off your uh, camera, Ross, as I introduce our next presenter. Uh, and that is um, Andrew Middleton uh, from uh, GeoSolar. Uh, so if I may introduce uh, you, Andrew, uh, you are the CEO of GoSolar. Uh, and um, Andrew started his career at a boutique corporate advisory firm called Questco, where he progressed from analyst to corporate finance manager before joining Investec and then the corporate finance division of Standard Bank. Um, he completed, where he completed a 14 year career in investment banking. Uh, Andrew then co-founded Go Solar in uh, 2021, uh, South Africa's first subscription-based solar company. And Andrew has a Bachelor of Science, sorry, a Bachelor of Business Science degree in Actuarial Science and Economics from the University of Cape Town and he is a chartered financial analyst. Uh, has a he has a chartered uh, financial analyst qualification from the CFA Institute. So, with that, uh, thanks uh, to you uh, for joining us, Andrew, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for the, the introduction. Uh, you've, you've reminded me of, uh, of many years ago. So, uh, we'll talk about solar today. Uh, but yeah, there were some other. Uh, path that I took in life. Uh, so thanks everyone and a great turnout. Um, so for those that don't know Go Solar, we we really specialize in the residential side. We do do small scale co um, commercial. So what I, the perspective I'm going to give you is how we see it predominantly from the small scale. We don't do anything that's uh, at the moment larger than 100 kilowatts. So I think that you know that industry is obviously a lot bigger. We're the we have very much a niche focus on, on the residential side and we'll give you our perspective um, on, on the market for solar PV and battery, which we believe is still very much in infancy, notwithstanding um, for load shedding and receding. Sorry, my, just a little bit of delay there. So I think just our first slide here now, this, this data is a little bit dated because we wanted to give some perspective on how ESCOM reports. So there was some interesting data that came out yesterday from ESCOM around uh, the estimate around solar PV um, in South Africa. I uh, really enjoyed the, the, the previous um, discussion uh, from GeoTerra, just showing uh, some other ways to get to this data because I think the better that we can get the data uh, around market penetration, the better for the industry. But quarter two was a, a load shedding free quarter, which we haven't had for many years in South Africa. So really good news. Interestingly, and we talk about outlook in this mostly, quarter two, there was 350 megawatts of, of, of rooftop solar capacity installed. And now that is anything that is not utility scale. So that's commercial, industrial, and residential. That that beat quarter one, which had load shedding by 236, uh, which had 236 megawatts. So quarter two, even without load shedding, was a stronger quarter. Data at the moment is showing, and we've got one more month left of the quarter, that quarter quarter three is probably going to be more like quarter one. Um, so the industry still um, is showing some resilience. It's growing. Of course, last year was a watershed year for the solar industry. We nearly doubled capacity. There was 2.6 gigawatts uh, generated uh, or installed in South Africa. Uh, this year, it's looking like we're more on track for a giga, gigawatt, but we'll see how things go in the second half of, uh, of the year. Um, I think what I really want to stress is where, where we get to where, where South Africa going is this is a global phenomenon. So I think in, in South Africa, solar is synonymous, at least at a residential retail level, with load shedding. It's, because, it's been this huge plot in our life, and we obviously understand why solar and battery um, is triggered with, with load shedding. But globally, we don't have these, um, these grid capacity issues, where in most countries we don't. But, it, but globally, no, no, uh, solar is the fastest growing energy technology in the world. It is fast becoming the biggest source of power generation globally. There were 447 gigawatts installed last year globally. About half of that is in China, amazingly. I think often people see China as, as pushing um, 
fossil fuels and investment in old, but that in old technologies, but actually China's the leader in, in PV by far. So South Africa, even though we are about a fifth of way of of Africa's um installed capacity generate um, new rollout uh, is only about 0.5% of what's happening globally. Uh, and we'll tell you why. Um, so this is a global movement. We mustn't think that it's it very much uh, limited to this country. Sorry, I'm just having a delay there. This is just a chart around the energy split between um, IPPs and of all sorts and ESCOM. So what you can see quite clearly the last 10 years coupled with load shedding, the trend has moved to us moving away from ESCOM as the uh, it's still the dominant um, producer of electricity, still by 86%. You can see the, the the line bumps a little bit. That's very much because of solar. So in winter, ESCOM uh, ramps up the coal fleet and the solar um, generation reduces. And obviously, that's also one of the, the good things around batteries, which I'll talk about. But what you can see is it's, it's growing quite rapidly, but we are still very much dependent on ESCOM. We must, we, we need ESCOM to be successful. I, I say that as an independent power producer. We can't, we At this stage, our economy needs ESCOM, a healthy ESCOM. So I'm very pleased to see what's happening at ESCOM and we need ESCOM to continue on its current trajectory. But we do need to diversify. 86% is still too high. ESCOM is in huge financial trouble, which uh, which Alistair showed. And it it's not, it's not a sustainable business in its current form. Things are turning, but we've still got a long way to go. So what drives solar PV around the world? And this is my view. And I, I really take it back to first principles. So initially, we start at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs. The bottom of the hierarchy of needs is really energy security. You need, if you don't have the lights, you need to find electricity. Electricity is one of the core things in business and in households that we need. It's, I'm stating the obvious here, but it, it's, it's fundamentally important to society. So you will do anything you can to find a backup source. So solar initially, solar PV was driven by load shedding. And that's what we see in, in South Africa when we had load shedding. In places like Zimbabwe, Zambia, where we start to see early adoption and low penetration rates, but really just a need for a hybrid solution to coexist with the grid or an off-grid solution um, in, in, in areas where there's absolutely no grid connectivity. So it's it makes a lot of sense that that's the, the start of the of the um, conversation. Then very quickly, once power has been restored or secured, households then or businesses need to look at their financial security and what's it and what's in their pocket. And that's where we see the next generation of driver of solar. And we see that in Europe, places like Germany, UK, US, it's really treated as a financial product, solar. So in the U in the UK, solar companies like Go Solar are regulated with financial licenses because they're seen effectively as savings products. And this is really what we see in the, the, the shift now in South Africa is we're moving from a backup market to a financial return market because as everyone else has shown, the cost of electricity made by ESCOM at the moment is just going up and up and up while the investment in technology on solar globally is reducing the per kilowatt unit cost of solar energy combined with batteries. So I think that's quite exciting. And in those markets, we're already seeing 10 to 20% penetration. Germany very much um, leading in, in Europe, Germany and Spain. And then right at the top is the sustainability angle. And you know we all, you know, I believe South Africans do care deeply about the environment. We've, we've got a, a wonderful environment around us, a, a diverse environment. Um, but it's very difficult to focus on the sustainability side when you don't have power and you don't have um, money in your pocket. So, you know, this does come and usually when you're in a wealthier country um, circumstance. And there we see the penetration. People are are willing to pay a premium for solar energy because they want to drive electric vehicles. They want to um, live a sustainable life. They've got to that self-actualization level. They're wealthy. And there we see Norway, Nordic, Spain, Australia, Netherlands. I mean, they're sitting 20, 30% penetration and growing. Um, so so it makes sense what, where we are in our journey is, is really what I want to summarize. With. We talk about regulation and I'll, I'll talk about it briefly. And there are some questions which I've tried to answer already. There's a lot of discussion around the tariff reform. So maybe let me start with tariff reform. And effectively, what we're trying to decide is who should get 
what part of the pie. So I think from our perspective, tariff reform is very important. It's very important that it's done correctly. If it's not, not done correctly, it has a whole bunch of unintended consequences for all sorts of actors. So of course, we've got to think about the customer. The customer needs a fair reflective price of electricity. ESCOM needs a, there needs to be a fair cost for access to the grid. I think at this stage, that's not fully reflective. So people that are accessing the grid are not paying the right price for the grid, but we also need to make sure that they're also not paying for inefficiencies at ESCOM. And then we need to be able to charge for the market related cost of electricity. And that should just be a fair market. Electricity generation should be an open market and it will it will change depending on the season, day and night. And, and there's some case studies that are very interesting that, that you can see where the cost of power really becomes competitive and the only differentiation of price is seasonality, time, and of course, what type of power you want. So in places like the Nordics, you can pay a premium for wind, in, wind power or hydro power because that's what you want to do. And if you want to go with fossil fuels that are cheaper, you can do that. But it's it's up to you and depending on how you want to live your life. Uh, but some of the but what we can see is ESCOM's prices are going up and we can't see a situation where they come down sustainably unless this tariff reform is not managed correctly um, and there's short-term decisions made. So we've already seen 33, 34% increase in the last two years. It's not been confirmed, but there's a lot of uh, leaks and information that ESCOM is asking for up to 44% pushed onto municipalities, 36% on them direct. And this is really a symptom of the costs, cost base at ESCOM, the debt that was mentioned earlier, huge debt. There is going to be some bailout and moving of that debt, but it's still a massive number. Alistair showed the the show uh, the slide as an, as an ex-banker. I, I get that um, they just cannot sustain the interest bill. So what that's doing is it's actually breaking the, the normal laws of supply and demand in economics. Usually when demand for your product goes down, you can lower your prices and you can try and get demand back. Unfortunately, in this instance, when customers are leaving ESCOM and they are en masse, there's plenty of data to show one of the reasons why we're not having a lot of load shedding is really the peaks are really disappearing. Um, and that's because of private power production, including solar. So when you start losing customers and your costs are going up, you've only got one choice, and that is to increase prices. What they are talking about is, is a 70-30 split, taking 70% of their fixed charges and slapping them on as a fixed charge versus 30. Now, that is a very high number relative to international case studies. So this is a topic that needs a lot of engagement from all around the civil society. Uh, we believe if this is pushed on, it will have a short-term negative impact on private power producers and households, but a very long-term neg negative impact on ESCOM because it will make the incentive, which I've um, which I've answered on the chat already, the incentive to disconnect much higher. I agree with the comment that was raised. At the moment, people are, are willing to have a hybrid system because they're not paying a massive amount to connect. But if that gets too high, the, the ability for households to then just take that extra step and disconnect becomes much easier. I, we just took just took the ESCOM proposal at the moment, not confirmed, and we just took a, a Home Power Three tariff, which is a common tariff that a lot of ESCOM Direct customers are on. If you're with ESCOM directly, not a municipality, and we just showed the impact that if we took what you're currently paying at your various consumption levels as the yellow bar, and what you would be paying with the new proposal, and because of the big fixed charge, what you can see is what it happens is it it starts to really impact low people that are using less electricity, okay? So it's usually your energy efficient users or your lower income households are now paying a lot more and your ultra high uh, pay, um, users of electricity are actually paying less. Now this is, you know, for, from our perspective, we think this is perverse in many reasons. Firstly, it's regressive. It's now making lower income households spend more on electricity and getting sub and effectively high users are, are getting subsidized by low users. So we're also now um, encouraging the lack of energy efficiency, which is still something that is one of the best returners on households and businesses is making sure that you use less electricity, even if it's from greener sources. So we hope this, this picture is not going to materialize because it's going to have a, a severe impact on low income households and businesses. Um, this is, uh, I think there was a, a, a slide on the IRP. We'll obviously see where that goes. There is still a, a forecast for the coal fleet to reduce. 
and it's, it's way more than that post 2030 i know there's a lot of um lobbying to try and extend those 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 um assets and i do very much believe in a just transition so we need to obviously think about that coal industry and how we're going to transition it in a in a managed way but that coal fleet is old and will need to be replaced and what often often i believe the misconception that we have in south africa is we're just always trying to solve for the gap the last few years we've had an energy deficit so we're just trying to always catch up but lots of data suggests for us to get our economy and our unemployment rate down and kickstart the economy we need to double the install capacity we've got today so we need 100 gigs of power not only to replace the old fleet but also just to actually move away from half a percent growth i think we're at 0.4 percent growth came out last quarter zero the quarter before so yes we're at naught to one percent growth and we're trying to get back to um an energy um to energy availability just to keep us there but we really need to grow so there's going to be a huge demand for more power i don't think um you know the the, the misconception that we don't need any independent power now because load shedding solved i think that's wrong we need to we always will find a use for power and that will come in industry and job creation and then finally, um, last um, last slide here. The um, we believe that no, sorry, it's not my last page, but it's uh, sorry, something's coming there. So the this is just I think back to the the driver being the the, the case the, the main driver being savings. Um, what we've just done here is we've we've highlighted a what solar subscriptions like Go Solar. Uh, what their price escalations will be and at this stage they very much kept at cpi uh, for most companies this is the escom forecast for the next three years so this is the outlook so this is where things become more and more attractive so um i think this page which we'd like to show you is just from our perspective just from our products we haven't looked at what you are using so some may own the solar some may rent to own it and some may use subscription but just with subscription right now I think what's important here to show is that in most of the main metros now, it's already cheaper to be with solar. So the Cape Town, it's already cheaper and continues to get cheaper. Cape Town has the highest electricity price as a, as a metro. Swane is also very much um, you know, better solar conditions and high electricity prices. Johannesburg, interesting enough, where we've seen the biggest demand. I was interested to see um, some of the previous slides around where solar adoption's been. We've actually seen Janusburg be the biggest driver of, of adoption on our products. It's very much still slightly more expensive. Solar is, is slightly more expensive in Janusburg on average for uh, subscription solar users, but next year we'll reach parity point. Same in Durban and in ESCOM, we are at parity now and will be even cheaper next year as ESCOM Direct. So I think what we're trying to show with this is we've hit the tipping point really countrywide when it comes to residential that if your solar is installed correctly and, and working and generating on average, you will start to save money from next year. And then we think a second wave of, of solar um, adoption will, will be driven and it will be driven from a positive reason, which is saving money as opposed to a negative reason that I, I, I'm frustrated and I need the lights on. So it's, it's all very encouraging. Um, to touch on batteries, um, Batteries, you know, it's it's a, it's interesting. We've always installed batteries. Uh, in there's a lot of use cases internationally where solar companies scaled and there was no batteries because initially the batteries there for for load shedding backup, and that is still the case that a battery is a, a, a nice to have um, when you you know you've got potential unplanned or planned outages. Interestingly, we track our customer settings and we enable them to change their settings. Overwhelmingly, around two thirds of our whole base is still set up for max protection, keeping their battery full because they are obviously still concerned about planned and unplanned outages. So batteries have that value. I think that's quite obvious. I think grid stability quite important. There was a, a slide showing the the famous duck curve, and and that's what we've seen. Eventually, there's so much um, production during the day, and not enough consumption that you start to see negative energy prices around the world in places like California, Europe, and grid stability issues. That's not good because the grid providers need to continue to energize the grid in the peak times where there isn't strong solar conditions. So those become very, very um, significant challenges. And there we've seen in other markets, uh, solar PV systems getting retro effectively fitted with storage, which we don't have that problem in South Africa because everything's fitted with storage. So I believe 
is a good opportunity for the solar industry to help ESCOM and, and grid owners and municipalities manage this um, manage this this problem. You also have tariff arbitrage. Uh, when when you have these peaks and troughs and dynamic energy prices, you um, you start to uh, be able to arbitrage when you use solar and when you use battery, and you make sure that you are consuming electricity from the grid when it's cheapest, and you're on your batteries at night. So you can you can you can play with it, and there's some nice algorithms and some nice technologies that we're working on. Um, and then the last point I mentioned was base load. It's often said, and it always uh, frustrates me to say that the, the, the argument mainly for, and I'm not a, against coal and, and nuclear, but the argument always for nuclear and coal is that solar and wind is not baseload. So guys, it's a nice to have, but it's not baseload. And what I would like to you know challenge is the combination of solar, wind and battery is baseload. The way that batteries are going, and if we get commercial batteries right together with small scale batteries and the technology and the cost right, there's no reason why the balance of renewable technologies can be baseload. Um, so that's, uh, I see you're up on the screen, Chris. So that is probably the, the concluding remark from my side. Yeah, thank, thank you, you uh, Andrew. Uh, some really interesting insights there, uh, including, you know, your, uh, you know, how you see the drivers, the major drivers, uh, and, and these uh, continue, um, you know, even after, uh, you know, the, the security of supply driver uh, perhaps reduces, uh, not entirely, but uh, somewhat. Um, and, and and I just wanted to say that there's another driver that you did not mention, and that is the policy driver. Um, and in fact, in South Africa, renewable energy started with a policy driver. It was not a security of supply. It was not a it was not a decarbonization driver. It was just a policy that we need to get into this business. And I think that policy driver even continues uh, to this day. Um, uh, and and uh, and I think uh, we, we'll continue. So uh, fantastic, thank you, Andrew, for for your insights. Uh, you know, primarily in the residential sector, but uh, I think it also extends uh, beyond that to the commercial sector as well. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to um, call a ten minute comfort break. It's now thirteen minutes past two. Uh, I'd like to suggest that we get back together at uh, ten minutes past uh, uh, one. Sorry, it's thirteen. 02, uh, 10 minutes past one. Can we be back again at um, exactly at 10 past one? That's an eight minute comfort break. Uh, and we will then start the proceedings again with the two further fantastic presentations lined up before we do the wrap up and, and Q&A. Uh, really a, a productive session so far. I found the presentations to be most informative and well put together. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you back at 10 past one. Uh, thanks, ladies and gents. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's exactly uh, 10 past one, and welcome back after the comfort break. Um, I trust you've enjoyed the presentation so far, and I see we've had a total of uh, about uh, 50 questions to date, uh, of which... Uh, 28 have been answered on the uh, Q&A session by the presenters, uh, leaving uh, 15 open questions uh, still on the q and I would like to thank uh, the presenters uh, and uh, encourage them to help me answer the questions on the text Q&A uh, facility. Uh, it's really helpful uh, to get answers to the audience and uh, allows uh, an easier session uh, when we get to the Q&A uh, session, uh, the verbal Q&A session, and uh, uh, where I pose questions to the presenters. If I can get as many of the um, questions answered in advance, uh, it means we can focus on uh, some of the outstanding issues and the big picture issues uh, uh, you know, during the Q&A. So thanks to the presenters, and please can you keep on and help me as far as you can answer answering the uh, questions on the Q&A text facility. So with that, uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our third presenter, uh, and that is John T. Sachs, who is a partner at Jaltech. Uh, and Jaltech is a boutique alternative investment fund ma manager, and John, Tech, uh, John T. is an admitted attorney, having previously practiced as an attorney at ENS Africa, that's Edward Nathan Sonnenberg Incorporated, which is said to be, and I hope uh, it's still correct, uh, Africa's largest law firm. So John T is responsible for driving um, Jaltech's growth, and he focuses his time on identifying new business opportunities 
raising capital for the asset management division and developing relationships with potential partners. Uh, John T has a Bachelor of Commerce degree as well as a Bachelor of Laws, an LLB degree from the University of Johannesburg. So, uh, John T, welcome and uh, over to you for your presentation. Thanks. Chris, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, going through the hundreds and hundreds of people that are that are in the session, I noticed a number of colleagues from ENS. So, it's, you know, quick hello to, to all of you. And my topic today really is I'm focusing on the commercial solar sector, where to and, and how. Um, I think a lot of industry players um, would have experienced a huge drop off in, in sales or a lag time in sales. And I'm going to touch on where we are and, and, and how do we get um, to the next step and, and what needs to really take place. Uh, some background. So at Jaltic, we're a fund manager. We manage over 2 billion rand. Uh, within the solar sector over the last year, we uh, funded more than 400 million rands worth of projects that amounted to over 160 projects. And that's around 27 megawatts. Um, we're looking to deploy an additional 600 million rand within this financial year. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, and um, uh, what we're seeing is still rapid growth in the space, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the market needs to position, position itself a, a little bit, um, given the fact that load shedding is now over. So load shedding was a really a catalyst um, in driving growth. And what it really did was reduce the time period in which clients um, uh, took to make a decision. Uh, there was a constant reminder daily uh, that there's no electricity and it really um, uh, uh, fast tracked the, the, growth of the growth of the sector because customers had to make a decision quite quickly. Now, unfortunately, without load shedding, and uh, decisions are taking a lot longer. Um, uh, historically, it took us about two to three months to, to close the transactions, now taking us six to eight months. And that's really because um, although energy saving is a priority, it's definitely not on the top of the priority for many businesses. So it is taking time uh, for transactions to, um, to close. But where really the industry is going to have to settle and focus is, is on energy savings. And really what is solar and offer from a savings perspective. And I know, I know Andrew touched on it quite a bit, but um, there are really three components for energy saving. One is low input cost, uh, really the cost of the systems, the cost of the installation. The second is a rapid increase um, in ESCOM's tariffs. And, and thirdly, and probably uh, the main focus of, of my presentation today is cheaper long-term funding. And we really have seen um, this being an issue in the market. And if we look at the first point is low input costs. Um, what's really happening in the market at the moment is we've seen a huge decrease in the cost of, of batteries up to, I think, around 30% so far this year. But suppliers are really under pressure. They've got a huge amount of stock. They've got big obligations to the bankers, giving them the trade finance to purchase the stock. And there have been a number of um, suppliers that have had to refinance uh, their stock, and it's putting pressure on the system. And I, we think invariably what's going to happen is and there'll be a bit of a, a price war in the market and the cost of, of, of goods will come down, which will increase the energy saving opportunity for the end customer in the market. And um, so this is definitely being achieved. Um, I think a number of the presenters spoke about ESCOM's tariff. We know that this is going up significantly, but even at the current rate, there's an opportunity for um, in the commercial space for a really decent energy saving opportunity. But the issue really is, is, cheap long-term funding and that's what the market needs um, and and what we're seeing in the market at the moment is if you go to the to your traditional funders being the banks uh, banks have a requirement that that the end customer puts down a bit of equity around 30 percent and if you're in the industry a solo installer or, or a developer is looking to raise um, equity to to be able to offer power purchasing agreements you may not have budgeted for this 30 percent uh, so it's a hindrance in entering the market for many energy consumers. The next issue is probably the most material is the funding duration is not aligned to the actual physical asset. And these assets have a 20 year lifespan. Uh, the, P, the, the solar panels certainly do up to 25 years. And there's a mismatch between the term, how many years the banks will offer funding versus actually the useful life of these systems which are under warranty. Now. If you had to borrow 10 million Rand and have to pay it back over two years, obviously your cash flow strain is immense. 
and you'd have to pay off such a large sum over such a short period of time. But if you had to increase the term, and I know this is very basic what I'm saying, but if you increase the term, your uh, your cash flow uh, um, strain is far less. Yes, maybe you'll be paying more interest over the term, but from a cash flow perspective, it's significantly less. And that translates into an enormous saving from an energy perspective. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So banks really have gotten it wrong in terms of the term that they can offer funding. And the second issue is long turnaround times. You know, if you're um, um, if you are raising debt, and you know, in our business for our solar fund, we raised debt. It took us a year, and we're in this business. We're in we're in the business of of fundraising. So if it took us a year, it's going to take other businesses similar time or longer, and it's just too long, especially if you're a solar um, developer or installer, and you have a customer who wants the product now. To then expect to wait six months to a year is just just not an option, and it's these are really real barriers to entry. So we really think that the banks have got it wrong. Now, um, what I'm showing you on the screen is really Eskom's tariff for large consumers of electricity. So a mine in the low season is paying 147, high season 234, and uh, in the mini flex you can see the rates and rural flex being the farmers, which is probably one of the biggest opportunities. For the segment of the market is they're paying an enormous amount for the electricity. They're very far from um, uh, the distribution uh, uh, um, lines. And um, what we've done is we've taken uh, an example where if you take a 10 million rand solar uh, project, it produces X amount per year. But that 10 million rand, we've, we've priced it over five years at prime plus two, which is basically what the banks give us. And we've taken that annual amount that you that you'll have to pay the bank, and we've divided it by what the system produces in a year, and that amount gives us a tariff. So if you took a loan from a bank on on this system that we that we uh, that we've used as an example, you'd effectively be paying the bank two rand sixty eight for the electricity that a system produces. Now, two rand sixty eight versus what currently Eskom's rates are, the savings it, it, it's it's non existent. And um, it's very difficult for a solo installer or developer to sell a product uh, where really the only opportunity is a saving where at, where if you incorporate banks funding, there actually isn't a saving. Um, so we really are seeing an issue uh, in this in this sector. And, and as I mentioned, we think the banks have got it wrong. But, you know, effectively, what is the solution? And the solution is there's alternative funders. And, you know, obviously, uh, Joltex Bias, and I'm going to take you through like how we see it and how we do it. Um, but there are other opportunities in the market to to also raise other than through us. But our our view is um, uh, funders should offer eight to eight to twenty years funding, and really it's the client's prerogative of how many years they want the funding for. We don't require any equity or security from the end customer. We'll finance the entire project, um, and then for us, deal turnaround is is very important. So um, if someone gives us a proposal in in the morning, by the afternoon they'll have an indicative. A proposal from us to to finance their um, their solar installation, and then within two to three weeks we can make the, the the capital available depending if the client's financials are already available and up to date. So for us, deal turnaround time is a real um, a real selling point. Um, but if we take the same scenario that I gave you earlier with the bank, um, ten million rand project, we do we price it over twenty years at prime plus two. That gives us a tariff of 118. Now, 118 is enormously lower, more than half than what the bank's offering. But if you look at the current rates of Eskom, it's, it's, there's a significant saving there already. And on this slide, what I've done is I've just taken the average of the two tariffs and I've compared it to the Joltec rate. And for the mines in that, in that large, large um, commercial consumer, there's a 73 cent saving, which is 38%. Um, and this ignores this massive increase, uh, which Andrew mentioned could be even as high as 44 percent, you know, roughly 36 to 44 percent. Um, and, uh, you know, large urban consumers is a 42 percent saving. And for the for the farmers, which we think is really a big segment of the market where there's an opportunity is 47 percent at the current ESCOM rate um, based on what we can finance at the moment. So if you compare us to the banks, we 118 where the banks are 2 and 68 on, on the same project. So significant opportunity for savings and you know for a solo installer solo developer to be able to access funding like this it's a it's a it's a really a game changer it's very disruptive 
And um, and the disruptive element of it is is clear in terms of the number of, of transactions that we're seeing on a monthly basis. So this is just the last four months and um, we've, we've priced and that means a solo installer or developer or an end customer has come to us and said, he has a proposal, give us indicative pricing, give us a competitive rate to, to our, our local funders. And you can see we've seen, you know, in May over 558 million Rand worth of deals we've priced on. And that's been the trend. August was our biggest month. We've seen an uptick in the market already. Um, but this year alone, over four and a half billion Rand we've priced in transactions. And we've done many deals already. And what I mentioned earlier is the deal cycle now is as longer, six to eight months. So our pricing is, is uh, the way that we have structured our pricing and funding into the, in the market has been you know taken up really, really well by the market. And um, we've been successful in deploying the capital across sizes of assets. So 100, 100 kilowatts all the way to two and a half megawatts, I think is our largest and across many sectors, schools, big market, agriculture, commercial property, um, student accommodation, et cetera. So it really is, our funding isn't sector specific. It's really been taken up everywhere. And, um, you know, the question is, where are we funding? Well, we fund businesses. So commercial, industrial businesses, um, be it farms, hotels, body corporates, estate, office blocks, et cetera, where the, where the counterparty, where the person where, we, where we're contracting with is a company, we'd be very keen on, 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 uh, on just quoting to see if we can provide competitive pricing. And our, our focus is South Africa. I mentioned commercial businesses and we'll fund a project from 1 million Rand all the way to 75 million Rand. Um, and our focus really is on new installations. Uh, so businesses that are looking to take up solar, but we're also active in the market in refinancing. So if you've got a system already up um, and the cash flow uh, strain is immense, we look at refinancing it over 20 years or even buying the asset. Um, so either either one of those two options is, is the area of the focus we're very active in at the moment. And we really focus either financing the end customer. So if you're a solo installer and you've got a client, instead of sending the client to a bank, send the client to us, we'll, we'll do the proposal uh, on pricing. Or if you're, uh, um, an EPC or a developer where you are looking to offer your clients um, power purchasing agreements, well, we'd love to finance yourselves um, and then you can unfinance the client. And uh, we do a lot of this type of business. We do a lot of work with, with solo installers um, and we'd welcome you know, any, any inquiries. Um, and that's really it from me. You know, short, sweet. Um, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll deal with them in, in the chat section. Um, but yeah, we're really open for business and 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 looking to 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 offer funding across any segment of the market. Chris, thanks. Oh, that's fantastic, John T. To see a positive outlook uh, as we move, as the driver changes from initially, you know, that policy driver uh, driven by government's reprogram, uh, you know, it didn't have anything to do with economics at that stage. Uh, and then, of course, the security of supply driver with load shedding being uh, the reminder every day that we needed to do something quickly. Um, and then as you've described, excuse me, I'm moving uh, as it moves now to, to, the, to the economic driver uh, where people are just looking at savings and, and really exciting uh, to hear your presentation about um, uh, how in fact significant savings can, can be achieved uh, provided, uh, you know, the term is right and you can turn around these deals quickly and, and your results seem to show uh, exactly, exactly that uh, that um, th that this new economic driver uh, can uh, keep this industry sustained, uh, and and of course then there's the longer term driver of of decarbonization and sustainability. So uh, really great to, to have your insights, uh, uh, you know, from person on the ground uh, doing deals uh, as to what's happening out there and where things are going. So thank you, John T, for that. Okay. Uh, you can switch off your camera now, and I would have pleasure now in introducing our final presenter before we do the wrap-up, and that is uh, Tim Hill, uh, who's a director of the Energy Group, um, He's an which uh, Energy Group is an ad advisor and developer of clean energy projects focused in the industrial and mining sector of South Africa. So you, you can see we started off with a sort of data look at it from GeoTerra image, moved on to the residential, uh, then moved on to... Uh, uh, the commercial sector, and now we're looking at the industrial and mining sector in South Africa. Uh, Tim's experience spans solar PV, wind, natural gas, and storage. 
and he has supported large energy users on renewable energy strategy formulation, project development, funding, and execution. And most recently, Tim has been working on a multi-phase 200 megawatt, 150 megawatt hour solar PV and battery energy storage behind the meter solution uh, for a large mining off taker. Uh, with the first phase of this project expected to reach financial close later this quarter. Uh, Tim has a BA and a Master, uh, a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts Honours degree from the University of Cambridge and an MBA from INSEAD. So a uh, great pleasure to have you, uh, Tim. Uh, over to you for your presentation. Thanks very much, Chris. I'll, uh, I'll jump straight in. Let me try and share my screen first. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is that up, Chris? It's perfect. Thank you very much. All good. Great stuff. Thanks. And thanks for making the time. So I think as, as Chris alluded to, a lot of the other presenters here are talking to what's happening in the residential space, maybe what's happening in the in the CNI and the agri space. And it's really interesting for us to hear those those specific perspectives. As energy group, where we're coming at the market is from the large scale private office. So this is large industrial customers, this is mines, this is maybe data centers who are individually looking to purchase renewable energy. In terms of maybe how my presentation here is being structured, so I'm just going to very quickly give a presentation, maybe talk about Energy Group for a few moments, and then share a few anecdotes around kind of where we see the market today, and then switch from there to where we see the market going and, and what the implications of that are in terms of sort of the solar PV and battery business case, specifically for large scale off -campus. In terms of who we are, so Energy Group very briefly, so we're a developer and advisor to large scale off takers here in South Africa. And the picture you've got here is a cross section of the projects that we've been involved in here in the market. So these are projects we've either been involved in as an advisor or as an IPP or asset owner, so where we've developed, fund, own, or operated those projects. It's about 21 projects in total. I think across the team, it's about 30 years of experience, currently developing around 1.6 gigawatts of projects, of which I think 8 billion have been financially um, closed in RAND terms. Maybe specific to energy groups, so we look at wind projects, solar PV, natural gas, and storage. Um, we look at projects behind the meter and on a wheeled basis, but it's very much South Africa focused. So that's a, a core area of our, of our expertise. Maybe jumping to, to the market. And I think, I think Alistair might have shared this slide a little bit earlier um, and highlighted a couple of points around this. This was the renewable energy grid survey that came out, I think about a month, a month and a half ago. And, and as Alistair alluded to, I mean, it's quite a remarkable picture in terms of the amount of development that's going on in the market today. And we certainly see that from the large scale off taker perspective. I think Alistair mentioned about 134 gigawatts of projects that are being identified as being under development. And maybe to, to contextualize that, I think the same survey last year, and maybe others on this, on this webinar will correct me, but was around about 60 gigawatts. So the amount of development activity at utility scale has, has broadly speaking doubled in the space of the last 12 months. That's obviously split PV, wind, batteries, other technologies, but it is PV predominantly. And, and interestingly, you know, if you unpick the stage of development of all of these projects, most of them are being positioned as being late stage, you know, subject to, to available grid for these projects to connect. So I think Alison made the point, it's kind of remarkable when you think that Peak energy demand in South Africa is, I, I think last year was around about 44 gigawatts, if I'm not wrong. And, and I think to the point around installed capacity, yeah, maybe somewhere between 50 and 60 gigawatts, of which obviously the vast majority is coal. So there's a huge amount of development activity currently going on in the market. Um, but the, I guess one counterpoint perhaps to draw to that, again, somewhat anecdotal, but if we look at, and here is the example, we're taking SARS data on imported solar PV panels into South Africa from 2012 through to 2024. So I think this is up to Q3 data. 
Um, and what's striking about that is if you take the first half of this year, and I think this broadly talks to some of the numbers that, that Andrew was sharing earlier as well, you know, you've got about 2.2 billion rands worth of panels imported in the first half of this year, which, you know, when you when you kind of net that out for panel prices, that's probably about 800 megawatts of, of panels that have been imported. So there's this there's this huge difference between the development activity that's underway and happening and the construction activity that's actually taking place on the ground. There's, there's clearly a lag there. But I think what we're certainly seeing from, from our side is there's a huge amount of activity in the market and we are seeing an enormous amount of, uh, of renewable energy development um, that, that we expect to come to market in, in the coming months and years. And so then maybe the question is kind of what, what are the implications of that going into the future? And, and maybe one implication of that is to ask yourself a question around what the grid might look like as more and more renewables come onto the grid. And I thought this might be an interesting sort of picture to share with the group in terms of this is an example of, of the Californian grid, right? And, and I guess what's interesting about this is the Californian grid is not significantly different in size than the South African grid as of today. So this is a, a snapshot from you know, 10 days ago. This is 24 hours of data on the Californian grid for the 24th of August, 2024. I guess what's pretty striking here is between seven o'clock in the morning and seven o'clock in the evening, 80% of energy demand in California was, was met through renewables. And if you were to draw the comparison with South Africa today, where you know, I think it's somewhere between 75 and 85% of our energy demand is met through coal. It's interesting to think, I think Alistair made a point around decommissioning of coal plants. To what extent, if we follow through on that plan around decommissioning of our coal fleet, to what extent will our grid start to look like something more akin to this in five years, eight years, 10 years, 15 years time? And, and that's probably something to, to, to try and reflect on. I think for us as a business, oftentimes the question that we're being asked is what's the implication of those changes in terms of investment or business decisions around renewable energy projects today. And, and one lens of, of looking at that is, is to start off by saying, okay, well, maybe I'm making a business decision today about investing or being the off taker to a large scale solar PV plant. And, and that'll be offered to me at a tariff, a, a PPA tariff, which is you know, the purple line on this chart. And ultimately part of the business case for that project is based around the savings that I'm going to realize relative to, the, to what I'd be paying to ESCOM. So effectively my, my avoided ESCOM cost, I guess the blue line on this picture here. And I think as a lot of the presenters have mentioned already, historically certainly it's been the case that ESCOM prices have increased well above CPI. So even on a real basis, you've got a, an accelerating savings profile between what you'd be paying to a private power producer and what you'd be paying to ESCOM. So what we're increasingly starting to think about as a business is if you believe that renewable energy penetration is going to increase, which we very strongly do, what are going to be some of the knock-on implications of that in terms of the savings that you can realize over time on a project like this. And so what are the sorts of effects that we're talking about here? So one lens on this is looking at what are the ESCOM proposed changes. And these are things like changes to time of use ban, changes to tariffs, movement between adjusted and fixed components of those tariff structures. Um, another change that I think we certainly anticipate that maybe is not so visible at the moment, but looking at other markets is is clearly where markets have gone, is where the market starts to restructure and you move away from monthly reconciliation towards hourly reconciliation um, on billing. The, I think there was a comment earlier, I think it was also Alistair's around 
the impact of the top factor. So to what extent will we perceive a change in electricity pricing in the middle of the day where that comes down very materially? And perhaps conversely, our prices in evening peaks actually start to ramp up very significantly. And then maybe lastly, what happens if that all happens maybe more quickly than currently people are anticipating? And, and what is the impact of that against the amount that one can save from a project? So maybe the point that we would make around this, certainly from our perspective, is we're starting to model this in a lot more detail than maybe we were three, four, five years ago. Um, and you know, maybe the savings profile that you're you're expecting to see is going to look very, very different depending on the extent to which you anticipate some of these changes taking place. Interesting, I mean, this is a this is a picture looking at an individual project. Um, the, the other way we often look at this is is through the lens of looking at maybe a couple of different projects um, with an off-taker. So, so here is an example where maybe as an off-taker, you're looking at potentially um, contracting with two different projects, project A and project B, and you have the option of contracting for a certain amount of uh, kilowatt hours or, or megawatts, um, somewhere between, let's say, zero and 400 megawatts on project B and zero and 400 megawatts on, on project A. And your starting point might well be to say, okay, well, where's where's my sweet spot in terms of my annual real savings over the term of that project? Um, and, and how do I strike the right balance between my commitments on project A and project B? And you can see here, sort of the sweet spot here sits at around about 700 and I guess it's 741 million rands per annum in this, in this particular example. What we're increasingly doing on our side is starting to pull some of those levers that we were looking at on the previous slide in terms of time of use spans, in terms of the impact of the duckback curve and seeing what the impact that actually has on the economics of those, of those projects and, and whether that talks to a different exposure between project A and project B. In this particular example, I don't think it talks to changing the balance between the two projects, but obviously the, the savings realized are, are impacted quite materially dropping from the 741 down to call it 550 million rounds on a, on an annual basis. What we see interestingly is you sort of if you look at this across different technologies, so if one is a is a wind project and one is a PV project, as you pull those different levers, your avoided cost and, and the impact of those changes start to look very different, and therefore the exposure between those technologies can also start to change. And the same tends to be true as you think about wheeled projects as opposed to behind the meter project. That maybe just gives a little bit of a sense of some of the ways that, that we're thinking about how some of those changes are likely to play through and, and the impacts as we think about kind of uh, project development at, at this point in time. Um, if we if we just jump across the batteries as well and, and spend a moment on that, I mean, this is, again, pulling the same set of data that I, that I shared a little bit earlier, which was really looking at renewable energy penetration. I think what's also kind of striking as you look at something like the Californian grid is in the evening, and this is obviously just one single day, but at eight o'clock in the evening on the 24th of August, the single largest source of energy on the grid was actually deployment from utility scale batteries, right? That was more than renewables, that was more than natural gas, that was more than hydro imports, everything else. And I think what that said is that the role of utility scale batteries and grids is not a conversation around what's the tipping point and at what point is this going to become compelling. It's actually that this is a this is an everyday reality in a number of the grids around the world. And I think if we think about that in the context of adoption here in South Africa, the the probably the most the single most important factor to think about is the rate of change in battery pricing. And what we see um, from what we're looking at and the projects that we're involved with developing is that battery prices have come down very, very rapidly, particularly in the last 12 months. So we're seeing about a 50% reduction in battery prices during that period. And actually, as you think about some of the market consolidation taking place where you know, I think CATL and BYD are now more than 50% of global supply of batteries. 
in terms of battery chemistry, I think there is convergence now around you know, specific battery chemistries as opposed to sort of NMC. So I think as that consolidation is taking place, so that's going to drive further price reductions and that's going to drive further adoption um, across the markets. And certainly for us looking at um, large-scale private offtake um, opportunities, we are already at the tipping point at which in specific business cases, this is already making sense. So maybe just to, to wrap up, um, in the interest of trying to keep to the timeline Chris had requested, what do we see for large-scale private off-takers? So we see that renewable projects under development are far exceeding market demand, particularly for PV. And, and I think what that means is that as a, as a potential off-taker, you need to screen very carefully for project fundamentals, for the ability of those projects to secure grid the certainty of those projects reaching financial close. Because almost by definition, not all of those projects are going to get there. I think the second implication is that I guess, a simplistic calculation of kind of your ESCOM avoided costs minus tariff multiplied by the term of the commitment that you're making, that's going to get you to what your savings are going to be. That's probably become quite a risky way to analyze the attractiveness of a project. It's worth testing that more thoroughly against a range of future pricing scenarios, taking into account some of the effects um, that, that we're already seeing here in South Africa and also have been prevalent in other markets. And then the third point is just to say that if it's not the case already, you really should be including batteries inside that renewable energy plan. I know we see very rapid market adoption over the next one to three years. Uh, why is that happening? It's happening because it increases and protects the value you get from investments in renewables. It, it enables you to decarbonize further and increase the penetration of renewables into your energy mix. Obviously, it does give you enhanced energy security, particularly if that's behind the meter. Um, and it also actually also potentially benefits in terms of enabling your, your grid connection. So certainly from where we're looking, we we see batteries as being a, not, not a question around tomorrow, but very much a, um, a live opportunity today for large scale applicants. So that's me covered. Chris, um, thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity. And thank you, Tim, for a really clear and concise uh, presentation. It's given uh, me some uh, thought there of, of yeah, the risks uh, when calculating savings. Um, and uh, to be aware that, uh, as has been alluded to, I think, um, by uh, Andrew from Go Solar, uh, you know, I even heard, you know, the Eskom uh, head of generation uh, saying something like, or was it the CEO saying that, this, uh, that there should be a 70% fixed component to the tariff and a 30% variable component? Um, and at the moment, it's just the opposite. And that does present uh, massive uh, issues, uh, issues that Andrew from Go Solar, you know, pointed out how, how this would so adversely affect uh, smaller or poorer customers. Um, and, uh, and, and also it would affect the economics and the business case of these uh, solar PV and battery storage uh, projects. I, I tend to wonder, though, whether the rapid increases we're seeing, uh, you know, in the price of electricity, even in the midst of these changes in tariff structure, such as, um, you know, the fixed variable component or in changing the time of use components, uh, that the, the price from the utility increases growing, uh, going up so rapidly that it, it might even counteract all of those, uh, still leaving good savings at the end of the day. But time will tell. And uh, But I think the point you've made is that it has to be taken into account. Uh, you know, you, you do have to think about these uh, potential changes going forward. And uh, yeah, your comments about battery storage pricing and what's happening elsewhere in the world, I think, are very relevant. And in fact, today, uh, South Africa has become a very important global market for battery energy storage, uh, you know, with the ESCOM procurement um, uh, funded by the World Bank and others. Uh, and then the uh, battery energy storage uh, uh, public procurements through the IPP office, uh, the best one, best two, and uh, coming soon, the best three uh, bid windows. Um, we've really become a big uh, player, uh, you know, globally. 
And I think that's set to to continue significantly. So really some interesting insights, uh, uh, but uh, enough from me because I want to call on our next and last uh, presenter, Jonathan First, uh, to give his um, uh, insights into what has been presented today, his personal insights, what he's heard, what he's seen, his takeaways. Uh, and so may I introduce Jonathan? Uh, he is a senior advisor an Africa representative for the Climate Policy Initiative, uh, which is an analysis and advisory organization helping governments, businesses, and financial institutions drive economic growth while addressing climate change. Um, after qualifying as a lawyer, oh, we got another lawyer now. Thanks, <laughs> Jonathan and John T. Uh, as qualifying as a lawyer, he spent 18 years in investment banking in London, Toronto, and Johannesburg and nine years in development finance. Jonathan led the DBSA's initiative to establish the GCF and the EIB funded climate finance facility in 2018. And previously, uh, Jonathan was part of the task team that set up the Impact Investment National Advisory Board in South Africa. And he was also a consultant to Fonerwa on setting up the Rwandan Green Investment Fund. So a wealth of experience there uh, from Jonathan, and I'm really honored to have you, Jonathan, and thank you for agreeing to uh, do the uh, summary and wrap up with your personal insights on what you've heard today. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, so I think this um, webinar comes at a very appropriate stage, um, given that we haven't had load shedding for a quarter. I think the presenters gave a very good perspective, both from an outlook point of view, but also the various, I suppose, sectors to the market. Um, but I really wanted to focus on, on two things, uh, which I think came out of this discussion today. The one is what I describe as load shedding, which Chris said seems to be um, receding. And the, the second one is a, is a theme around the disintermediation of Eskin. Um, so if we start with the sort of load shedding, um, I think the one question I'd really like to pose, which comes out of the presenters, is, is it really over? And we talk about, or well, they, they outline two types of dynamics. The one is energy access and security, and then the other is energy pricing or savings. On the energy access and security, um, obviously on the access side, um, there was a very good analysis um, in terms of the geo mapping, that there has been obviously a lot of development at the higher income, um, higher income levels or middle to high income levels. I suppose the question is, does this translate to greater access to the people that can't, that sorry, can't afford to do their own solar uh, solar systems, um, and then also obviously the dependence on the grant system from from national treasury. Um, on the on the security side, I mean, have we have we actually seen the end of of load shedding? And I think there were two two themes. I think in that in that regard, which I came out the one around the one is you know we have had very low economic growth. Have we seen a turnaround in economic growth as a result of uh, I suppose a better a better political situation in South Africa? And then the second one uh, was how much longer can we maintain? the sort of coal-fired power stations. And in particular, you know, the government cannot ignore CBAM. So, you know, is energy security really energy security or are there factors that might um, change the situation? On the savings side, I mean, it's quite clearly that the, the savings are sort of politically self-made. Um, the one that um, Alistair mentioned was obviously the cost of Madupi and Kassile, which I understand is half of Eskom's total debt, plus, of course, the reduced demand, which is driving um, tariff increases. Um, and then, of course, tariff distortion, which was out outlined by a number of presenters. I think also the reality is that all the presenters, that's the presenting on residential, commercial and large scale utility, have s continued to show that there is increase in um, in sort of solar projects or the, the building of solar uh, solar independent solar um, projects, 
Um, and this one figure that really stuck out was this 134 giga, gigawatt pipeline, of which I think 50% is well advanced. So quite show, quite clearly shows that despite the fact that load shedding seems to be receding, um, the price or the savings is driving the market. So that's very much on the sort of the first theme that I wanted to touch on. The second one is the disintermediation of ESCOM. And I think someone made a comment that, you know, we do need ESCOM. I think the issue with ESCOM is that although it has been stabilized, um, it's still, a, I believe, a structurally damaged utility. Um, and then I think it's there's so much inherent damage in ESCOM that, you know, the, everything has to change. So I'm not suggesting ESCOM will disappear, but I think the dynamics around ESCOM will change. And this is my theme around the disintermediation of ESCOM. And once again, you know, three areas that were outlined by all the speakers was number one, generation. Um, and I think it was Go Solo who said that, you know, this whole issue around, you know, baseload. Well, Eskom's always going to be around because solar isn't baseload. Well, you know, Go Solo, I think it was Andrew made the point as well. It, this is not correct because solar, wind and batteries actually is going to represent baseload. So that, you know, that is sort of on the generation side. Um, the other thing as well is that, you know, I've, I've seen and we've all seen over the past few years that the generation has developed in four different areas. The one is the, the large scale corporate utility scale, um, which was addressed by Tim. The municipalities now, um, municipalities such as Cape Town, obviously very progressive in terms of its own power generation. There's, of course, the cor corporate and uh, commercial and industrial market, which was discussed today, and, there's the, the, and the residential. So on the generation side, I, I believe there is disintermediation of ESCOM, and it's happening at an alarming rate. On the transmission side, once again, I mean, we all know the issues, the challenges around transmission. I mean, as Alistair outlined, we've actually run out of capacity in the Cape and East, uh, the Cape, uh, the Western Cape and Eastern Cape. And we know that transmission is takes an enormous amount of time to actually roll out. And then on the distribution side, on the trading side, um, and this with two points were really made here. The one is that Eskim is no longer a bankable off taker for the IPPs, which has led to the development of the trading market. And then, of course, you know, on the negative side, Eskim's um, reaction or the, dis the Eskim distribution, the reaction to the granting of licenses. I think um, very much uh, supports this. So I think on, I would, I would like to sort of finish by saying that I think that the renewable energy market, um, certainly as outlined by the speakers today, is very much alive, um, very much growing. And I think despite the fact that we are, we seem to be at the end of load shedding, um, the renewable energy market, the alternative energy market will continue to thrive. So um, once again, thanks very much to the speakers, and I think a very a very um, good session today. And thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, really an honor to have you here doing this wrap up, uh, giving your insights as a very informed uh, and involved person in this sector. Uh, it gives a lot of credence to what what you say and what you've taken away uh, fr from this webinar. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's just uh, remarkable. Uh, we're absolutely spot on in terms of our timing. Um, and that is remarkable uh, based on past experience. So thank you for the presenters for your timekeeping. Uh, and, and it's now time for the Q&A session. Uh, and again, I want to thank uh, our presenters for answering uh, a total of 41 uh, questions uh, on the uh, uh, on the Q&A, the text Q&A. Uh, there are still 21 questions that are open. Uh, so I'm going to attempt to tackle uh, some of these, not necessarily one by one, but uh, in, in some of the themes that I've noticed uh, that, that have developed in, in the questions. And I also would like to then uh, also handle a few uh, questions and answers via the hands up uh, facility, uh, which we'll do after tackling a few of the text questions. Um, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if you want to ask your, your question uh, directly, um, if you haven't had it answered already to your satisfaction or whether you've got in, in, a new question. So 
I, I want to start off by um, uh, talking to um, uh, to go solo to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, you talked about this seventy thirty split. Uh, and by the way, can I ask all the presenters to switch on your cameras so that we can see all of our presenters uh, as we do this uh, session? Um, it, it's quite nice to to engage with you all and for the audience to to see who they're talking to. But uh, Andrew, you talked about the 70-30% per, uh, split between fixed and variable costs, which is what the SKMC CEO was suggesting. And you pointed out the, uh, you know, the, the, the consequences of this. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask you, what do you think it should be? Uh, I mean, should it, I mean, the CEO says that the 70%, 30% split is cost reflective. Uh, should it be cost reflective or what What do you think it should be, uh, you know, to be equitable to smaller customers, uh, but also equitable uh, to utilities? Um, uh, if you can give us your thoughts on that. Thank you. Sure. Um Sure, Chris. I'm, I'm trying to put my camera on, but I think I'm in a bit of a tech challenge at the wrong time. But at least you can hear me, hopefully. We um, so we've we, we've put it out there in our in our in our research that we shared. And and again, there's no exact science here, but we just we struggle to see international case studies where 7030 has ever been applied. So you know, we've we've got access, fortunately, to say, and some people that work with us that have done uh, done this in an international context and. Tariff reform is often um, on the topic, and this this debate often happens. But we've we haven't been yet seen an international example where seventy percent is fixed and thirty percent is variable. We've seen a lot of cases where it's been 50-50, and in most cases it's been forty sixty. So forty percent fixed, sixty percent variable. I don't doubt that ESCOM has seventy percent overheads and fixed costs, but that may also be due to inefficiencies within ESCOM, which doesn't mean that it's reflective of what the cost to maintain and use the grid should be. Um, so that's why I think we, we obviously, are, it's good news that ESCOM is, is separating into the, into the different businesses and we can really start to see what is the sustainable costs to manage the transmission grid, which needs to have a fair charge. And what is the and and what is the right cost marginal cost of electricity? And we can see that John T's mentioned numbers of of one rand eighteen cents. We've seen numbers close to one rand as well uh, for for PV. Um, so I think we can get to a market related price of electricity, but we need to figure out what's the fair cost of the grid. And we we don't think it's anything more than forty sixty. But again, we we need to do a bit more work and science around that. Yeah, thanks for that. And. Um... I'm going to move to a question which I think uh, can be answered by how long is a piece of string, but uh, nevertheless, it's a question, uh, and it's been brought up by a number of our presenters, and that is, uh, what is the load shedding expectation for the near future? I mean, I get asked this question uh, all the time. Um, experts expected much higher levels of load shedding compared to what we're experiencing. So, uh, look, I'm going to, this is from Nicholas Ferrer van Skalkbeek, uh, and uh, I'm going to just tell you what I think. <laughs> Uh, that I, I think we we could be in for a, a reasonably easy going um, the next three years. Uh, I do think we may experience intermittent load shedding, uh, but I see that um, there's a good chance that it, uh, levels of load shedding will be dramatically lower than what we experienced last year. Um, that's my view, uh, but I'm going to ask one of your. You know, but ob obviously. Uh, you know, that's just a quick gut feel. And what really has to be looked at is a proper techno-economic study, which is an integrated resource plan for electricity that is done properly, that looks at the demand, that looks at the supply that could come on, that looks at what's going to be decommissioned by ESCO, that looks at economic growth. And there's a whole lot of assumptions that go into it. And But finally, you know, one comes out with various scenarios. Uh, so I'm not sure that anybody can answer this question uh, 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 without such a, a deep dive study. But Tim, I just want to ask you, what is your gut feel? You've heard mine. Your microphone, Tim. Can you put your mic on, Tim? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So I'm not going to be able to add very much to your comments there, Chris, to be honest. Um, I think it's looking into a crystal ball. The, obviously, the energy availability factors have been much better than people had been expecting over the last six months. Uh, I 
I tend to kind of align somewhat with you, with your view in that I think the short term uh, prospects look quite good. I think the medium term prospects are still very much in question, and and I think that perhaps talks to some of the things Alistair alluded to earlier, which is you know what is the state of ESCOM and ESCOM's ability to sustain investment into its own infrastructure, um, as well as what are the plans around decommissioning and the, and the implications of that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I see another question here from Kurt Wellman, uh, which uh, I would like to read out and then add a bit to myself. Uh, and, and he says, driving from Joburg uh, south on the N1, there are quite a few low income areas where there's a mass rollout of solar hot water geysers. But it is shocking to see how many of these are incorrectly installed and, for example, facing south. And I want to add to, to that question, that issue, and say, you know, I also drove from Pretoria to Johannesburg along the highway, and, and I was amazed how few of the very large building warehouses, factories that you see there have got solar PV installed. Now, they, they do have some that are installed, but there's a remarkable number that is not installed. Um, uh, so that, that's the one point. And the other point, um, uh, you, you, you know, is that, and I'd like to put this also to um, Andrew, uh, please. Uh, I mean, we know how badly these solar hot water geysers are installed. How well are the residential solar PV installers doing? Uh, you know, are they also doing a lousy job? Uh, or, or is there an improved level of, uh, of of skills that are putting together, you know, competent uh, installations, uh, or, or, or are they largely, uh, you know, poorly put together installations? Mm -hmm. So I think firstly to Andrew, if you can answer that, and then we'll yeah. take a look at the commercial opportunities. Uh, we'll go to Geltech uh, on that. Sure. Over to you. No, sure, Chris. Um, no, so, so it's it's got a lot better. So the the last few years there's been significant scale in the installation industry. That it used to be a big bottleneck, um, but the the huge wave of solar adoption we've seen residential and everywhere has led to um, you know installers moving from you know single electrician firms sole proprietaries into big corporates uh, and actually scaling and and really building their their capacity. So. Um, the quality has improved significantly. There is still some work to be done. It used to be a major bottleneck for us, but there is there is now a lot of good skills out there. But you unfortunately do still uh, deal with some quality issues every now and again. But um, but it does get resolved. So I, I don't think at this stage it's a bottleneck. But a lot more can always be done to improve quality and skills development. Yeah. Look, I'm going to redirect this issue actually to Elsie and Ross about this huge number of rooftops that I see on large commercial uh, operations, you know, between Joburg and Pretoria in Midrand area, it's it's massive. I, 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 and, and how big is the opportunity out there? Uh, if I can address this to Ross first and Elsie, if you want to come in as well. Ross, your microphone. Sorry, Chris, could you repeat that? Apologies. I, I was just saying, dri driving from Joburg to Pretoria, I see a, a huge amount of rooftop space on these large uh, warehouses and factories that does not have solar PV. Can you give us an idea of what, what do you think is the opportunity out there? Let's just say in, in, in the Joburg, Pretoria, Midrand sort of environment uh, for, uh, for commercial uh, rooftop solar PV. What kind of scale are we talking about as to what, what could be still installed? Sure, I don't have the the statistics on that in front of me, unfortunately. But yeah, I think we think there's definitely a big opportunity for that in these areas. Um, I think a lot of factors come into play. Uh, the type of buildings that these are, um, what those companies, individuals' needs are. Have they, you know, what kind of, what draw would they have? Have they got uh, refrigeration that they need? You know, things like that. How critical is energy to what they do on a daily basis? So, yeah, it's, a, it's difficult for me to answer uh, that sort of on the spot, but there's definitely a lot of opportunity there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess your, your data doesn't show, you know, the type of roof, whether the roof is structurally able to handle, uh, you know, a large amount of solar PV panels. Um, uh, the, could that be a influence your market outlook? Yes, absolutely. So, 
we are obviously limited in some ways. It's difficult to know structurally if a roof can handle that kind of thing for sure. But there is a lot we can tell about the type of roofs, definitely, um, to some degree. Uh, so it is definitely something that we could look into, you know, to a degree. Mm. But definitely. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm. Thank you. Elsie, Elsie, do you want to add to it at all? Nope, nothing to add. Thanks, Chris. Okay, no problem. And so let's now uh, move uh, to uh, another question here. Uh, and, and I see this from Derek Hartman. He says here, regarding load shedding, how does the current slump in the mining sector and the other intensive energy in uh, industries uh, contribute? And I presume he's talking about, yeah, contribute towards uh, load shedding. So I think he's asking to what extent has load shedding been uh, helped or reduced, uh, you know, due to the... Uh, the, the the energy intensive users uh, shifting away from South Africa, maybe, uh, and, and, and through, through the reduction of the energy intensity of South Africa, which is also largely driven by price. So how much is driven by demand and how much is driven uh, by increased sources of energy and how much is driven by increased performance of ESKIM? So there are, there are three factors. Uh, Tim, maybe you can uh, come in here. Uh, as you're quite uh, involved with the energy intensive sector. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. I, I think at a, at a macro level, the fact that energy demand is far below what we would expect it to be based on economic growth projections clearly is a factor. So I think to, to pretend that's not the case is wrong. But conversely, I don't think it really explains the short term movements. So I don't think, you know, if we compare this year versus last year and we attribute that to um, where we are in the commodity cycle and that being the, the most significant driver, I don't think that is, I don't think that's the right answer. I think it's the other factors have probably been more significant in the short term. I think the other, the other point to raise, particularly around a number of the, a number of the mining companies is that they don't have that ability to turn up and down their energy demand very easily. So a lot of their energy costs are to a certain extent sort of fixed stroke structural um, and so it may not be quite as large a factor as as one might perceive from the outside thanks okay i, I see a, a question here from mohale mafalo uh, and he asks a question what is the current local producers of battery energy storage in terms of manufacturing versus imports and is there opportunity in the manufacturing side on the lithium battery uh, for lithium uh, batteries. So I, I think I'd like to divide this question up uh, because there's the individual cells uh, who that are built into battery packs and the battery packs are installed into racks and the racks are installed into containers or into different uh, housings for residential, commercial, industrial, utility application. Uh, but the question is, you know, what is the level of local content in, in batteries. Uh, and I'm wondering who would be interested in handling uh, this. And I'm looking to uh, to maybe to Andrew to come in here and give some insights on, on, on the battery bar. I can give also some, after you've finished, some of my own insights on the, the state sure. of local manufacture. Sure. So um, I was also going to divide it into the two parts. There's no, there's no local cells, really. Um, those are all brought in, um, but there is there are a number of good quality manufacturers that are assembling, designing, and and also designing the battery management system, which is very important. Um, there are some some that just do the design and get it manufactured in other markets and brought in. There is a lot of imports, so I think this is one area certainly where there can be a lot more done to encourage local design, local manufacturing on some scale. Um, we do have the the are lithium deposits just north of the border in Zimbabwe. So, uh, you know, there's no reason why we we can't start uh, if you know having a regional play there. We I definitely believe that battery manufacturing has has good potential in our industry in our local industry more so than potentially solar panel module uh, production, which is at such a grand scale uh, globally, especially in China, that it's going to be very difficult to compete there. But I think certainly on the storage side. South Africa can play a good role. Yeah, if I can just give you a few of my own insights. Uh, as you say, cell manufacture, there's nothing like that in South Africa, but 
there is no reason why a mega cell factory uh, couldn't be uh, done in South Africa as it is being looked at in countries like Morocco and uh, other in countries in Europe or, uh, you know, around the world. Uh, but it needs a partnering with, uh, you know, one of the major cell uh, manufacturers, uh, Chinese or Korean or American. Uh, but they could see Africa as a market big enough for the electric vehicle market, uh, which is what this whole thing drives upon. I mean, the lithium cell, the lithium battery manufacturing, the cost reductions are not because of stationary batteries for the power system, for, 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 uh, for, for the utilities, but it's driven by electric vehicle uh, volumes. And we, uh, you know, the stationary batteries are riding on the back of it. So we, we could, it could be seen that Africa could become a place where you could have a mega factory in partnership with one of the bigger ones, but not, not yet. But I, I do see the local assemblers of battery packs, including up to container level, a company like Blue Nova, part of the Renit group, uh, is doing it. I visited, you know, a site where they've got five containers of batteries, all locally assembled, a really impressive installation. So it's happening. But when it comes to the big stuff, I'm talking about the Eskom uh, stuff and, and, and the public, uh, uh, you know, procurements, the demands for quality and reputation and experience and, uh, uh, you, have, you know, having a reference list this long of projects that you've done is so demanding that no local assembler has got that level of experience or has a reference list that long. So it would have to be done in, a, with, in partnership. And there's a very significant investment in testing that would be required. So I think for the time being, you know, it's going to be limited to assembly of uh, small and medium and uh, container sizes, but not the, the mega projects. That's my view. Uh, but uh, let's move on to another Another question. Well, I tell you what, uh, let's go to the, the people to put up their hands. Uh, so anybody who would like to ask a question, including, uh, you know, those who have asked the test question, text question, but haven't got an answer to what they want. So anybody who wants to put up their hands to answer a question, let's move to that now. And I see uh, we've got a hand up by um, Carrington Tlala. I hope I've pronounced your, your name right, uh, Carrington. Uh, but Carrington, if you're there, I'm going to allow you to talk now and please uh, switch on your microphone and ask your question. And anyone else who's got a question, please put up your hand um, and uh, we'll come to you. Carrington, your microphone is still off. Uh, are you still there? Uh, okay, Carrington's mic is on now. Over to you, Carrington. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the colleagues. Uh, um, I appreciate. I think the insight was really helpful. Um, I think from my side, I, want, I just had a general question, uh, and I think it goes to mainly the concern um, around the changing dynamics with regards to the viability of renewable projects. Are, are we really certain that taking the balance from the increasing tariff that when it's going to reach a point where it doesn't become affordable anymore versus the affordability part or the modeling part on the tariffs themselves, whether would we have a sustainable, um, renewable energy sector to the 20-year PPA period? I think that is one of the clarities that I need um, from the colleagues. If, if that would, uh, is it possible to get to a point where we could say that a 20-year PPA um, would be sustainable up to that point. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Carrington. Uh, Alistair, we haven't called on you yet to answer a question, so maybe uh, I can uh, feel that it's your way if you could give us a quick answer there. Yeah, I think one has to be careful that <clears throat> you don't uh, confuse the increase in tariffs um, with uh, the death spiral of ESCOM, there, there are a number of reasons the tariffs have gone up. One is is the death spiral of ESCOM. Um, the, the, the other is that um, obviously you're in, incorporating new power into the grid and, and there are studies that have shown that by putting new renewables into the grid that the tariff increases have, have been less. Um, I've already mentioned Madupi Kosile, which are major causes of tariffs going up um, that cost 
close to 500 billion rand when they should have cost about 160. Um, and that was due to the cost overruns and time delays um, in the rolling out of those and, and the contractual structures. So in, in the future, we're going to get to a point where you and I are going to put solar and battery on our rooftops because it's cheaper than the average ESCOM tariff. Um, and that average ESCOM tariff is going to carry on going up for as long as as uh, as the death spiral of ESCOM continues. So, so I, I would just just urge you to to not to not uh, blur the or, or to make the distinction between uh, tariff increases relating to the cost of new generation versus tariff increases due to grid defection and and cost overruns um, at ESCOM. Thanks, Alistair. I hope that answers the question. I, I, I see your hand up, uh, Cecily, but I'm going to just move to another question that I'm going to read out. It's a kind of a tongue-in-cheek question, but uh, it's directed to you, John T. Uh, and, and I thought it'd be quite fun to handle that. And the question is, John T, why are you complaining that banks are getting it so wrong? Judging from your presentation, they're handing you a lot of business. So <laughs> can you give us your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I'm certainly not complaining. Uh, I think what our, my intention was really just to illuminate um, the opportunity for alternative funders in the market. So, you know, <clears throat> I think banks are in a very fortunate position. They have got hundreds of thousands of customers that are corporates and they can just, you know, open the tap and, and, and try and get that business where in our market, this is more important to really uh, uh, inform other players in the market and also and customers that the alternative funders out there in the market. So certainly not complaining. I think um, ourselves and other players in the market have a really strong niche against the banks. Better pricing, quicker turnaround, and and other uh, and other benefits. But yeah, not, it's not a complaint. Yeah, it shows what nim the nimble private sector can do against these uh, large, uh, much slower, uh, much more bureaucratic, uh, and much more risk averse organizations. Uh, and that's where where people find their niche and find their their space to operate. Uh, interesting um, uh, business model. Anyway, I'd like to now move uh, to Cecile uh, Christiansen. Uh, please, can you switch on your uh, mic, uh, Cecile, and ask your question? Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to speak to us today as well. It's been very insightful. Um, I wanted to ask you guys a bit more in terms of batteries and best in South Africa. Um, from what we see so far, at least, a lot of uh, BESS is driven in uh, a solar paired or a wind paired context. Um, so I just wanted to hear from you guys if you have perspectives or your personal takes on what the attachment rate currently is in terms of BESS, best with solar, BESS with wind, broken down by segments or also just in general what you see in the market. I'd be really fascinated to hear your take on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilie. And uh, yeah, I, I, I responded to Cecilie's question to say, what does she mean by attachment rate. Uh, I was wondering, uh, does this mean, you know, the banks repossessing projects that they've financed? And uh, But uh, you've made it clear. It's uh, it's to what extent are wind and solar projects uh, linked to a battery energy storage uh, project? And um, I don't know, I think the best person to handle that would be Tim. Tim, what is your take on the linking? I'm talking about large projects as opposed to residential projects, which I think there's a huge linkage at residential level uh, to, uh, to battery storage, but at, at large uh, industrial mining and utility scales, to what extent is that linkage happening? So I think the answer to that question probably has two parts. So the first is what is true today? So how many of the large scale PV and wind projects currently have batteries attached to them, to which the answer is it's a relatively small proportion. But what I would say is that as you think about, for example, grid applications grid in Africa today, I would say most all of them include battery storage to be paired with whichever the, the generator source is. So there's a very big difference, I think, between what's been installed to date on the ground versus what's planned into the future. Thanks, Tim. Um, okay, uh, we've got a few more hands up, which I'm going to take one by one. Um, firstly, um, Mahale Mafalo. Uh, Mahale, can you please switch on your microphone and ask your question? Uh, 
Mikhail, are you there? Could you please switch on your microphone? Okay, he doesn't seem to be uh, switching on his microphone. Perhaps he's left. Uh, I'd like to now go to uh, Chisakulo Kaputu uh, and ask you, uh, 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 Chisakulo, to please switch on your microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you, uh, presenters, for, for, for uh, the insightful presentations. My question is around uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, we, we had sold uh, solar PV, including base solutions, on the basis of uh, providing load shedding uh, solutions. That, that was uh, the business case. Uh, so if you now look at, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list maybe four aspects and, and I would like a comment and, and maybe ranking them. And, and therefore, uh, now if, if, we, if, if we pivot from providing load shedding solutions as a business case to looking at arbitrage, uh, decarbonization, price hedging and energy, energy security and energy security in the context of affordability, uh, availability and sustainability. Uh, could you comment on these uh, as for as, as as a new 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 way of uh, motivation and and how do you rank them from the most viable to the least? Thank you, thank you, Chris. Pleasure. Okay, I think uh, Alistair, I mean, you've got a big picture view on these things. So, uh, how do you see it? Um, are you willing to stick your neck out? I was so busy writing you a, a message to say I wanted to respond to Cecilia's question that I didn't hear uh, that. Well, that you can one. do that. At, you can do that at the same time. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that the in terms of best development, there, there's a short term issue, and that is that there's grid constraint in the country, and and those projects that are hoping to develop in areas where there is grid constraint. Um, are obviously holding out for um, for all of the legislation to change for for congestion on the on the grid, and and if you put in best, then you'll be able to dispatch your power or spread the power um, over over time. Like your your solar will, will will not have to dispatch during the during the day; it can be dispatched in the peak hours, for example. Um, in the longer term, I think that we're going to get more battery procured by the system planners to to enable that load shifting from from the peak hours or to the peak hours from both wind and solar uh, which are generating outside of the the peak hours so i think there's going to be lots of of new battery in the short term most of the most of the ipps that didn't submit bids in bid window seven of the of the reap program uh, uh didn't submit their bids because they were non-compliant because they were trying to submit bids in areas where there was grid congestion and and there wasn't capacity. With batteries, they would have been able to supply. Yeah, interesting so point there. Mm. Can you repeat the other question? I'll have another go. <laughs> um, yeah, let me just think. Uh, I, I think I've forgotten the question, so perhaps we can ask um, uh, Kulu again to just I think what he was asking, uh, maybe I'm wrong, uh, was can you rank the different drivers um, that we are experiencing now? You know, we've got the policy driver, we've got the um, uh, security of supply driver, we've got the security of supply in terms of economics, in other words, uh, making it more affordable, um, and then the, the whole economic driver, and then the decarbonization and sustainability driver. How do you rank these currently? in terms of where we are. I know it's a, it's a, not a hard question, and it's not a, a question, it's not a to give a scientific answer, but just a gut feeling. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I think the biggest challenges in this country right now is is finding the the grid capacity to install all the projects that are, are trying to get developed. So in terms of policy, it's, 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 a, it's a critical issue, unless, ESCOM, NOSA, and the and the Department of Energy or Electricity uh, prioritize and build new transmission lines. We, we're not going to be able to realize the potential projects that were that are coming through in the in the grid survey. 
So policy and rolling out new infrastructure to accommodate new projects is possibly one of the biggest issues facing the sector right now. Uh, the next one that that obviously is going to is going to affect all of us is is what um, what are you paying for power? Uh, you know, to to swallow a thirty percent tariff increase every year. And my municipality in Johannesburg um, is unashamedly adding thirty percent to their tariff, uh, which which is not the way the rules are supposed to work. It should be a straight pass through of the increase in cost from from ESCOM. But in fact, they're just applying the same percentage to their tariff. So at some point, people get um, fed up with that, and there's grid defection. Obviously, in in one of the presentations we got, it was clear that the the only real people that are able to to defect are those who who can afford to do so. But but it's becoming an issue for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Doug. There's two. Could I add, uh, Chris? That, uh, could I could I add to that one, Chris? Uh, just because we yes, see quite please, a lot Andrew. of yeah, we Thank we you. see quite a lot of real world uh, well consumer data on this, and um, I think on the regulatory piece, there's not much regulatory incentive. There was a little bit on solar panels, so there's very little regulatory incentive on households. So we don't see that as a driver. However, it's, it was definitely a driver on businesses, and maybe John T can give more more flavor on that because the hundred megawatt change, without a doubt, we've seen. Has um, has enabled quite a quite, not incentives, but at least a removal of some bottleneck. But certainly, if we focus on uh, security, uh, financial financial security and sustainability, still without a doubt, power security is the main driver. We see that even without load shedding for 150 days, uh, they, that is when there are load reductions, when there are outages unplanned. That is definitely the driver for households. I think businesses are thinking a bit more long term. But I think what we what, what we think is that there's going to be a shift um, and they're really starting to see a shift to the financial benefits. And, and that's where I think businesses are already seeing that. Um, and that's where CNI is still a lot more resilient, I think, than, than some of the other sectors. Um, and the sustainability part will come, uh, but it, it, we need to solve the other two, two things. So unfortunately, and we survey customers, uh, the, the sustainability part is, is, is third. Um, so that's, that's my perspective on it, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we say load shedding is, uh, has uh, almost come to an end, and, and it has. Uh, but load reduction has not come to an end, and uh, cable theft and transformer theft and uh, has not ended. And there's still a lot of outages uh, that are not load shedding related uh, that are very significant, uh, you know, from a customer experience. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a point uh, well well made. There's two more questions, and I want to make do these really quickly because we've reached the end of the uh, webinar. But uh, Michelle Ribarola always has uh, a spanner in the works and throws us a controversial question. Can you ask your question, Michelle? And uh, if you can keep it short, and uh, as we move on to the last question, oh, I need to just allow you to speak. Just hang on. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. Okay, you can now switch on your microphone, uh, Michelle. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, no, nothing controversial. Um, the problem at the moment is with the information that is available from ESCOM is trying to unpick the real contribution to um, <clears throat> the grid of, of renewable energy. If one, in simplistic terms, if you look at dispatched versus dispatchable, that should give you an idea of how much uh, less than what ESCOM should be selling they are effectively selling. Uh, but for some reason, it's very difficult to extract that information out of ESCOM. Um, and just one point for Alistair, it's actually not only the death spiral of ESCOM, it's the death spiral of property owners. Um, where I live, my municipality charges me 700 Rand a month uh, as fixed charges, as availability charges. My unit charges are 250 Rand a month because I use about 120 units. Uh, so if I look at the cost, unit cost for me, it's almost eight rand a kilowatt hour. Uh, and <laughs> the problem with PV systems is that all the, 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 the paying customers have left because those are the ones who could afford to actually leave and, and install their own PV systems. So it's, it's actually going to get worse unless somebody in government decides that maybe we should look at a bigger picture. Maybe we should put our thinking cap on and say, how are we going to actually resolve the problem before the goose that lays the golden eggs is just going to leave because it's just going to become unaffordable. Um, it's more expensive now for me to purchase power 
in South Africa than it would be to purchase power in the most expensive place in Europe. Uh, and that's a fact. And, uh, you know, the more customers leave, the more expensive it's going to be. And you can't just say, because I'm not connected to the grid, I don't pay those charges. Because the, unfortunately, there's a constitutional court decision that states that you can't cherry pick out of the municipal account what you want to pay and what you don't want to pay. So those fixed charges are going to increase every year, the more people disconnect from the municipal suppliers. And it's going to be a huge problem in time to come because all the ones that are left are going to be the ones who don't pay for the services they get. Okay, Michelle, I, I think it was more of a comment than a question, but I, I, I take your point. We are facing a massive disruption. Uh, it, it is dis disruptive or disruptions are messy and uh, we can talk about just transitions, but I got a feeling it's going to be anything but just. It's going to be a messy uh, a transition, a messy disruption that, that, that lies ahead. And, you know, going off grid completely doesn't even solve your problem. When you go off grid, you still have to pay the fixed charge, even though you're not connected to the network. You have to pay the fixed charge. I mean, in Chwane. And, and, and uh, I think in Johannesburg as well. Uh, it's everywhere. You get away from it. It's everywhere. Yeah. So uh, with that comment, I want to just move on to Bertie Stratum. Uh, Bertie, I'm switching on your microphone. You've got the last question of the day. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's, it's a bit of a bigger question. Um, we've all seen that within the first two best rounds, there was an oversubscription. And a lot of projects has been developed and was in the first round not successful. And in base two, there will be a lot of projects that will not be successful. What is the alternative for those sites that has been developed? Because they are specifically earmarked for specific substations for which capacity might be constrained. So is it a sunken cost for those developers or what is their alternative? Tim, I think you are the only one I can think of to answer this question. Um, I know Bertie has thrown a, a difficult one. Hi, Bertie. How are you? Um, yeah, I mean, in the in the short term, I think the answer is that those are sunk costs at this point in time. Um, whether there's an opportunity to repurpose those in the future as the, the energy market continues to liberalize up, you know, I, I would suspect that there is. Yeah, I, I can only say that I think the best market is about to grow quite significantly. It's already become a big, big. Uh, we're we're big in the in the on the world stage, uh, and I think it's uh, only going to become bigger as the economics uh, drive it forward. Uh, constrained uh, constraints in the grid are actually an opportunity for battery energy storage, uh, as was pointed out uh, earlier. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the batteries can un uh, un can release capacity, uh, you know, within the grid if you place them strategically and not necessarily uh, linked to a solar PV panel, but strategically placed within a distribution or transmission grid. Ladies and gentlemen, we could go on uh, uh, a long time still, but we have come to the end. In fact, we've four minutes over time. Uh, but it's been a fascinating discussion. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I know I have. And um, and uh, to, to all the uh, people that are attending, um, you will get a feedback report. You will get the you will get the um, uh, list of the presentations. You will get a video recording, uh, uh, you know, of the webinar, uh, and that applies to those people that did not attend but did register. So anybody that registers will get uh, this report, even though they may not have attended because of other commitments. So uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. I want to thank again um, uh, the companies that have supported this webinar uh, and the uh, people that have made the presentations. And in particular, I'd like to mention uh, Vantage Green X. Thank you for your support. Uh, GeoTerra Image, I think there's a lot of interest out there in your services, and uh, I will feed back contact details for all of our presenters so that people out there can make contact with you. Uh, uh, to, so to GeoTerra Image, thank you very much. Uh, to Jonathan First from uh, Climate Policy Initiative, thank you very much. Who have I left out? So I'm looking, I know I've left out somebody. Oh, yes. Uh, Energy Group, Tim Hill, thanks for that. Uh, Jaltech, uh, John T. Sachs. 
and uh, go solo, Andrew Middleton, uh, really uh, top notch speakers. And I think it's been a, a very worthy uh, webinar that has delivered value uh, to the uh, people that are watching it. So thank you, everybody. And we will see you, I hope, at our next webinar, which will be coming up within a couple of weeks. All the best.